Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. I am your host, Michael, along with me again. This week is my co-host. Ken, how you doing, Ken? Good. How you doing? Hang in there, man. Hang in there. Uh, this is the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Uh, for those who are new to the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, um, P4P Box Report is a uh, YouTube show slash podcast slash blog that discusses all things boxing. Uh, our model is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is... If it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. Um, if you want to find information about the Pound for Pound Box Report, there are two main places you should go. You should go to the Pound for Pound Box Report blog page. The link for that is p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. Repeat that, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. You can also go to the podcast page. The link for that is p4pboxreport.podomatic.com. Then we'll repeat that, p4pboxreport.podomatic.com. On the blog page, you will find all previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report, plus articles written by yours truly. On the podcast page, you can find uh, all previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report uh, podcast. On both the blog and the podcast pages, you'll find links to where to find the Pound for Pound Box Report all over social media, all over the internets, um, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Google Plus, uh, Podomatic, Tumblr, uh, Twitter. The Twitter handle is at P4P Box to Report. Uh, got a Pinterest board. You can subscribe to our RSS feed. Uh, we're on Stitch Radio. And you can find a link where you can donate your account. And the link for that is donateyouraccount.com slash P4P Box Report. Let me repeat that. Donateyouraccount.com slash four slash P4P Box Report. Be a friend, be a pal, be a buddy. And donate your Twitter account. And what happens is any tweet that comes from the Pound Pound Box Report Twitter page, your Twitter uh, account will automatically retweet any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page. But those homework matters out the way. Let's get this show started this evening. Uh, doing a recap of what went down this previous this past weekend, excuse me. Um, and let's start with possibly the upset of the year so far in 2014, as uh, Rogelio uh, Porky Medina uh, scored a shocking third round upset of Jaylion Love. Uh, heard him with the right. First two rounds were whole hum. So so looks like to me that uh, Love was kind of filling him out, if you will. Uh, but then all of a sudden, Medina struck first with the right hand and kind of buckled and hurt Love. And then as both fighters was on the ropes uh, or in the corner, I should say, uh, Regina follow Medina, excuse me, followed up with a left hand that put Love down, uh, made him fall face forward, put him down, and basically out. Um, nasty shot that had uh, Jelly on Love's legs uh, twitching on the canvas. Um, look, and I'll go to you on this one, Kent. Look, the right hindsight being 2020, the writing was on the wall, if you really think about it. Um, Love has had uh, issues with his chin, uh, been knocked That's down three, time, three times in his career. And when you look at Medina's record, look, he had lost six fights. Um, include four of his last six fights, but uh, he's had 30, 30, 26 knockouts in his in thirty three in his previous thirty two wins. So he had a bit of a punch, if you will. But so you can see, um, and coming off the fact that um, I believe this was the same Medina who beat um, Badu Jack, if memory serves me correct. Um, but yet and still, when you look at it. Um, this has to be considered an upset, a huge upset from Jaylion Love as nobody, and I repeat, nobody saw this saw this knockout coming. No, no. I, I thought Jaylion would be knocked out at some point, but I didn't think it'd be against a middle-of-the-road guy like Medina. Um, going into the fight, he was 32-6 and six with 26 knockouts. He had come off losing four of his out of his last six, as Mike was saying. Um his his losses came to good company. Um, he's been stopped the three times. He was stopped was against uh, Yori Boy Campus. Um, uh, um, um, Gilberto Sanchez um, and uh, and Badu Jack. Those were his three to stop two losses. His other three losses were in the other guy's backyard or hometown, and they were all, I think two of them were, either, two of them, one was a majority decision, another one was a split decision, and the other one was a unanimous decision, but keep in mind, these were all in the guy's hometown, so it could have been a much closer fight, 
or he may even won those fights because there's no footage, so we really don't know. I'm on YouTube anyway. So uh, Medina coming in was expected to be the opponent, played a role, you know, as, as the way Mayweather's side was looking at it as far as Jay Leon Love was concerned. But but uh, Medina came to win. He had said in the, in the, into the days leading up to the fight that he was coming to win, and he was well prepared for the fight. He had been training for three months um, ever since the Gonzalez fight, which I thought Medina beat Gonzalez. In a, a Jonathan Bamba Gonzalez, um, but he, but he didn't get the decision in that fight, um, even though he was busy and landed bigger shots. Um, but going into the fight, based on how he performed against, you know, Badu Jack, you know, which who was another prospect before losing to Derek Edwards. Yeah, let he, me make a correction. Um, I said I said uh, Regina, I said. Uh, Medina uh, beat uh, Badu Jack. I'm wrong. He lost, and the guy who Badu Jack was knocked out by was Derek Edwards. I'm sorry. Pursue that. Yes, and so basically, in the first couple of rounds, it was just a very tentative fight by by um, Jay Leon. Um, uh, Medina was busier. He landed some good body shots. Um, he had. You know, love bat on the back foot in those rounds. Um, he looked very, you know, um, looked um, love looked hesitant to let his hands go. He just didn't look right. He didn't look right from the opening bell. It just seemed like there was something there. He looked, he fought very tentative. He looked, you know, wary. You know, very concerned about something. You know, I, I would assume you know, Medina's power, um, even though he's quite slow and 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 he's and it's the best way and the only way I think he you know, and the only way a slow guy usually catches somebody that's faster is usually in an exchange because they're they're both swinging. Um, but yeah, I thought the first two rounds were, were, were Medina rounds simply because he was busier. It wasn't that he didn't do anything spectacular. He was just busier. And, 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 you know, judges don't like when, in a, in a fight, judges don't like guys that go backwards and, 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 and run. And that's what did, Love did the first two rounds. He stayed on the back foot. He moved a lot. He didn't throw many punches at all. I think he averaged 32 or 33 punches in a, a round before, in the first couple. He, that was his average, and that's way too low. That's way too low. It's not going to get it done. You know, and, and, and against a guy like Medina. Um, in round three, um, within the first 30 seconds, um, there was, you know, Love did some dissimilar things, moving around, throwing a jab to the body, you know, which ain't going to do nothing, really. And then they got near near the, um, the far corner, and Medina drew a right hand to hit him on the side of the head, and his his he went backwards. He went backwards. It stunned him. You could see it stunned him. And then as both of them were heading into the corner, they both exchanged left hooks. Medina's got there first, caught him flush, and knocked him flat on his face. And that was it. There was a, as soon as just that quick, the fight was over. It was, it was very good win. Very good win for Medina. Um, it's not. It's a nice story. Um, I don't think he beats anybody of significance, but I'll tell you this: it's nice to see a, a story like that coming four out, losing four out of your last six. You know, you're not expected to win to begin with, and you come out there and you pull the biggest upset of your life. That that's that that was a great moment. That was a really great moment. It was a great moment, but I also agree with you in, in saying that I don't think Medina is going to do much uh, moving forward. Um, I have a question. Uh, I said that um, hindsight 2020, you can kind of see this happening if you really think about it, uh, because the fact that uh, Love has been has shown a shaky chin in the past, and the thing about Medina, he can have he can, he he does punch, he he does have power. He can punch. Excuse me. Uh, when you look at this result, do you think that part of the responsibility uh, goes towards um, Heyman and, and Mayweather promotions because knowing um, 
loves issues with his chin. Uh, maybe in spite of the fact that uh, Medina has lost four of his uh, previous six fights, maybe it wasn't the best idea to put him in a, in the ring with a guy who has power. Yeah, I think it was not a good idea. I'm going to just clarify this so any any haters who want to jump in and, and start saying I'm pouncing on Floyd, let's just be – we're going to just be honest, okay? We're going to come out and say Floyd Mayweather is only the figurehead at promotion. He's not dealing with the business moves. That's not his – he, he probably wouldn't know how to really get that. He, not that he wouldn't know how. He just doesn't get involved in the business stuff with his fighters. That's, that's Al Heyman and the Watsons and those people. Those are the people that handle the business, Leonard Ellerbe. Those are the guys that are making these moves. And I feel like I'm, I, I, you're starting to realize that these people don't seem to be boxing people. They seem more like businessmen. you know. And that's a common trait in boxing. Guys who have a lot of money, who can throw cash around, can get involved in the sport very easily. Okay, I'll, I'll give you some prime examples. 50 Cent, um, Rock Nation, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, anybody who has cash to burn seemingly wants to get involved in boxing. And I think this is the same situation with Al Heyman. He, he was a concert promoter. He's not a boxing promoter. He's a, he was a concert promoter, and he had money, and he got involved in boxing and started working with Floyd Mayweather, and then it opened the doors up for him, you know. But I just don't think they're very knowledgeable boxing people. They don't understand the nuts and bolts of moving their fighters correctly. In the last year alone, they've gotten four of their fighters stopped. You count Love, Badu Jack, Mickey Bay Jr., and Thomas Williams, all in the same calendar year. He, they, they have gotten them a loss, and they were all undefeated before. Before they, they were, you know, and and you didn't really. They, there were signs there that they could could have been beaten, you know, based on their uneven performances and 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 just simply they just looked vulnerable at times. Um, and 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 if and if you want to count the Broner fight against Maidana, you can count that fight too. Even though Broner was on that level, you could tell after the first round, he had no business being in the ring with Maidana. There was just like night and day. He was not ready for that type of fight. And I think a lot of it, too, has to do with the, the brain trust at Mayweather. And I also blame, like, the spar like the gym situation. They always fight. They always spar with boxers. They never spar with rugged guys, guys that can punch, guy, you know, Guys that 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 are not necessarily boxers, but they move forward and they're aggressive, you know. And that's why I think a lot. Uh, that's why I think Robert Garcia's gym is so successful because he got a lot of those type of rugged fighters in there. They're not just dealing with boxers; they're dealing with sluggers, guys who who are offensive minded. And I think that has a lot, to, a lot of, you know, a lot to do with it as well. I'm not going to squarely blame, put everything on the brain trust. It's also the gym situation, you know, only dealing with certain sparring partners, and it just it's just starting to show itself slowly. It's showing that there's there's problems with this with this with this you know promotion as far as moving their fighters, getting them to proper work, and it just it's starting to make a little bit of noise. And I think it won't. And and if it hasn't become evident to anyone yet. You just just look at the guys that his fighters of that that Heyman's fighters have lost to recently. Guys simply that had no business. They just weren't ready for those fights, even though they were named fighter. Like they weren't named fighters. They weren't necessarily world class fighters, but they were experienced fighters. Guys that have been there and done that and probably fought you know top of opposition on the way up. You know so. It, it, it just it, it, I think there's a lot of things going on there, and I'm not going to just judge Floyd because I don't think he handles the business stuff. Like I said, I think it's Ellerby, the Watsons, and Heyman. They're, they're, but it's clear they don't really know the nuts, like the real nuts and bolts of boxing. And I'm not trying to diss anybody. It's just evident. It's just clear that they just don't know how to move fighters properly and into the right fights. Let's move on. Uh, on the undercard of uh, Love and Medina, uh, Badu Jack, uh, who was a world-rated super middleweight, uh, making his comeback um, after being starched by uh, Derek Edwards in one round um, in his last fight. 
uh, made his return to the ring against Jason Escalera. A scored a unanimous decision win. Uh, shut out on two cards, uh, nine rounds of one on the third card. Uh, in assessing Jack's performance, what do you think? I personally think after getting off to a shaky start early on, he kind of found his bearings a bit. And, and look, he did what he, he was cautious, uh, but he, he did what he had to do considering how he got stretched against Edwards. Uh, I wasn't too upset at his performance. No, not at all. He fought a smart fight for a guy that got starched in like 90 seconds against yes. Edwards. You have to fight like that when you first come back. When he, he got moved, that ring, he moved, he used the jab really well. Yes. Um, and I was impressed by that. And you, he basically just outboxed this kid. Yeah. Listen, es Jason Escalera is he is what he is. He he didn't have much of an amateur background, but he had he was coming off of two wins against prospects. Fringe prospects. I'm not going to call them full-blown prospects because neither one was well known. But they were fringe prospect, undefeated. One was seven and zero, and the other guy I think was fourteen and zero or something. Um, but he came in on a little bit of a roll. And Jack was coming. This was his first fight since February this year. Um, after the first couple rounds, he came in. He came out. You know, used established his jab, moved. You know. Fought smartly, you know, went to the body. You know, just fought a very, you know, patient fight early. But as the rounds went on, he started to pick it up. He started to throw more in combination. He started, you know, really pushing out the jab and getting really throwing stiff ones out there, you know, and, and, and just really dictating his offense off the jab. Um, but for the most part, he looked really good. He fought a smart fight, you know. And people are going to complain. Oh, and then I've heard some complaints after. Right? Oh, it was a boring fight. Well, after it being starched in 90 seconds, are you trying to make it an exciting fight? I don't think nope. so. <laughs> I think I think you're trying to get your confidence back and trying to get a win. And that's what Jack did. He built. He got his confidence back after the first couple of rounds. He was. He was. His confidence rose as the fight went on. It was. It's like. It's like learning how to ride a bike. Or relearning how to ride a bike. You have to get back on. Well, actually, yeah, riding a bike. Let's just put it that way. Or relearning something that you haven't done in so long. Um, and 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 once he got his feet on the pedals and started, move, you know, starting to, you know, ride the bike, he felt better. He felt more confident in, in that he could do it. And 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 as the fight went on, you could see his confidence growing. He fought good. He fought good. He fought a smart fight. And if people are going to, you know, you can't really judge him off of this, this performance because he was out of the ring for six months. And the last m memory of him fighting was being laid out by Derek Edwards. So he had the reason to go in there and fight a smart fight and get a W. And he did. And he looked good. Jack was on the verge of a world title opportunity. Um, he lost to Edwards earlier this, earlier this year, I believe it was. Uh, how... How long do you, how many fights do you think that about do Jack needs before he uh, gets to that level of, of possibly challenging for a world title? I'd say two or three more fights. I think he needs to get back in the ring as soon as he can and, and get back to work. And uh, Personally, I'd, I'd want to get a rematch with Derek Edwards. I wouldn't let that sit on your record for the rest of your career and not address it. I mean... It, 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 that, that's the thing with me. I want to see him rematch Edwards and show people what got him to be a top prospect. And I think that's what he needs to do if he's going to continue, you know, on the on the way back up. I think he needs to consider a fight with Edwards, and and just keep moving, fighting guys that he was fighting at the same level. Just keep fighting that level, and you and the opportunity will come. I I just think it'll take you know some. I think it'll take you know, some fights before I think he's in that position again, but he got off to a good start on Saturday. Um, overseas, uh, Marco Huck uh, tied the record for cruiserweight title defenses with a home hum win over uh, Mirko uh, Largetti. I mean, look, and, and look, Largetti, he was undefeated at coming into the fight, but he had, hadn't faced anybody worthy of even being considered a world uh, title challenger. Considered to be, uh, yeah, considered to be a world title challenger, or deserving of a world uh, of a title challenge, deserving of a challenge at the world title. Excuse me, get out. Yeah, 
uh, ho hum fight for the most part. Uh, Huck controlled it throughout, far as I was concerned. Um, exploded in the last round when you thought he was going to be a decision. He exploded in the last round, almost took him out. Uh, discussed the quickly discussed the discussed analyzed the fight and 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 give a breakdown of Marco Huck's career uh, um, at cruiserweight. Even though he yes he defended he's tied the record for the uh, defenses tied Johnny Nelson. Uh, where do you assess? Uh, Marco Huck in the historical cruiserweight landscape. I rate him in the top five, and I and I rate him in the top five because look at the defenses he's made, and 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 the, and you know he's a guy that doesn't shy away from fighting the best, even though he's from Germany. Fought Arslan twice. Fought uh, Ola of a lobby. Dennis Lebedev. Yeah, he's fought he's fought some really credible guys at uh, two hundred pounds. Yep, and he also can, you know, stake to the claim that he also be Alexander Povetkin, but that wasn't that cruiserweight. He he he's probably in the top five because he's being he hasn't shied away from from big you know, you know the tough fights, and, and you know a lot of German fighters. Not that they avoid top fighters, it's just that a lot of fighters from outside of their area or or Europe. You know, we'll just won't travel over there in fear of you know, a just a bad decision not going their way. But he's been able to fight the best. I mean, he's he's beaten the best. You know, he's given guys rematches if there were disputed fights. How many guys do that? Not many. Um, and I'm gonna be honest with you about his performance on Saturday. He got off to a really good start. I thought he he won the first five rounds, but then in the six, seven, eight, nine. He kind of like he started to get stagnant, and I think Largetti, for what it was, what it's worth, he he put those rounds in the bank simply because he was he was doing you know starting to land some some good clean shots. Um, he was busier, you know, and he showed that he could hang with 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 a top cruiserweight. You know, going into the fight, people thought you know it's just another ho hum, you know, like another easy defense, you know. What has this guy done, you know, to earn a shot? But I think he showed that he deserved a shot. I mean, he, he, he won those rounds, and then in the big round, the most important rounds of the fight, 10, 11, and, and 12, that's where Huck shined. He got back to what he was doing the first five, five rounds, and he almost stopped Largetti in the 12th with a big shot that, that you know, that buckled Largetti's legs, and he fell and into the canvas, but it was right after the bell. And the ref ruled it no knockdown, and a you know, and 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 the fight ended. But it was a good performance. I scored at 116, 112, same as the two judges. The guy who scored at 118, 110 was wrong. I, I didn't see that. I didn't see that fight. Um, but for what it's worth, Huck Huck did what he had to do. He won. He made a nervous defense, successful defense of. Of, his, of the WBL Cruiserweight title. Largetti proved himself to be a worthy challenger. Um, we'll likely see him again. Um, he's a good fighter. He's not a great fighter. He's a solid fighter. And I think he'll get another opportunity down the line. And I think a guy like Largetti could win a title against a guy like Yon Pablo Hernandez, who, who, by the way, didn't impress against Arzalon his last, la last time out, which was recently. And... Um, you can make the case that, that Arzlan won that fight. So at the end of the day, I think Hawk is a top five cruiserweight all time. Um, if he were able to unify the division, either get Hernandez or Larchick in the, in the ring for unification and win that fight, then I think I'd push him into the top three. He, he's, he's, a, he's gone on a historical run. He's cleaned out the division. And, and there's nothing more else you can ask for him at Cruiserweight. If he doesn't get a unification, from what I understand, his promoter is probably going to go to America and move up to heavyweight. Not not necessarily like in the Klitschko territory, but, you know, the smaller heavyweights like Adamic, Cunningham, and, and Glasgow, and, and, and guys of that size. He will never be the real behemoths of the division, but he, he can hold his own and beat guys that are close to his size. I will only mention this because um, this almost took 
this this was as much uh, discussed uh, uh, during the, this this uh, how can I put this? I will only discuss the, what I'm about to say next only because it almost took uh, precedent over the fight itself. Uh, Johnny Nelson, uh, who I said before, Huck tied the record for a number of title defenses. Um, he was on hand at ringside, watched the fight there, at ringside for this fight. Um, he had made some kind of shady remarks about uh, Marco Hub, said that he would beat him during his heyday, and talked about the possibility of coming out of a retirement, said that he would do it, but he would need six months of training to do so. Should we take this seriously? Personally, I don't. I know, I know Johnny Nelson, he stays in terrific shape year-round. Um, if you've seen him and if you've seen stuff on him on YouTube, you can figure that out. But uh, I don't take all this talk about um, him possibly coming out of retirement to, to fight Marco Huck. Huck, by the way, said that, listen, after he sets the record for title defenses, he would love the opportunity to beat uh, Johnny Nelson up. But, again, I don't take this seriously, but it has to be mentioned because that was part of the story um, evolve, revolving around this fight. I think it was done simply to give the fight attention. That's all it was. To get the fight attention. To get people to watch. To see what Johnny would do after the fight. And Johnny did nothing. He, he went after the fight, he went up and shook Marco's hand. And they took a picture together. And I knew right there that was just to get people to watch and to pay attention. It was a rating, it was it was a it was a it was a little bit of um one it was a bit of um, you know, selling the fight, I think. I don't think, listen, Johnny, Johnny, listen, Johnny Nelson, I have a lot of respect for him. Great cruiserweight champion, you know. And a very good broadcaster, by the way. Yes. Yes. yes, he is. I mean, I don't agree with everything he says, but you know what? If, if we agreed on everything in boxing, it wouldn't be any fun. So, but he, but he's a well-spoken guy. He's a respectful guy. I, I couldn't read anything into it. I didn't think he really meant that. I just think he was having some fun, and I think he was giving attention to the fight because there was a lack of attention towards it. I think he was just giving attention to the fight and getting ratings and 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 getting people to watch this. And, and it was a very historic moment. And when if 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 Huck were to fight one more time at cruiserweight and unify the division. On that fight, I, I mean, he's 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 going to be considered one. You know, he's already an all-time great at the weight to begin with. But I think that would cement it even more. Yeah, well, let's move on to uh, the boxing news uh, of the week and kind of couple of uh, news events broke uh, today. As a matter of fact, as a tape, uh, as of the taping of this. Uh, show and podcast if those who look will be listening to podcasts on uh, Podomatic and on Stitcher. Uh, shocking news out of uh, Tenerife, island off the coast of Spain, as a uh, newly crowned IBF welterweight champion, uh, Kel Brook, and you can read about this on my blog, Alpha Pound Boxing Report blog page. Uh, Kel Brook, while on vacation with his wife in Tenerife uh, early this morning, uh, was stabbed in the leg, um, according to reports. He bled heavily but made it to the hospital and as, as of the taping of this uh, show was in stable condition. Um, your thoughts on this? Uh, how much jeopardy does this stabbing put into his upcoming title fight, title defense on December the 6th? And, and what does this says about, and it says about, first of all, English boxers going into Spain because this is not the first time that something like this has happened to a uh, boxer from the UK. And to Kel Brook personally, this is not the first time he's been stabbed. There was an incident back in 2007 in his hometown of Sheffield, England, uh, which he was stabbed. Uh, again, assess what went, went down today and with Kel Brook. Uh, I just think that, you know, you know, you have people out there, you know, in the world that, you know, that, you know, they, they, they're at, they, there's always going to be hooligans out there. But... Since this is the second time something like this has happened in Spain within a month, including, you know, what happened to Jamie Moore, he was shot up. Yeah. And give folks who don't know Jamie Moore. Uh, Jamie tell the Moore folks that is, is. Um, is, um, was training Matthew Macklin for a fight in Ireland against Sebastian Highland, 
about a month or so ago, and he was gunned down in Spain. I believe outside the hotel, he was gunned down. Um, and it's it's see, the, the thing is now, I think a lot of fighters should stay out of there, especially from the UK, because they're a target now. You know, they're, they're, it seems like they're a target for whatever reason. Um, it also could be boxing, something to do with boxing, you know, because... I don't know, because Tenerife is a hot training spot, because uh, I know Nigel Ben during the last uh, few years of his career, uh, that's where he used to tr uh, set up his training camp in Tenerife. And I right. know there's some other British boxers as well, prominent British boxers who uh, set up camp there. Yeah, I, I think it's... it's, it's had definitely, I, I thought, you know, at first I thought about it, it sounded like Cooligans, but... You know, I'm starting to wonder, is there, like, something to do with boxing down there, some, some sort of, you know, politics issue or or, or issue with, with who's handling Brooke and, you know, animosity? You never know, with, you know, in, in this day and age because there's so many nefarious characters associated with boxing. You don't know who's dealing with who. You know, you don't know what kind of company Kel Brook is keeping. You know, it could be any any a multitude of things. It's very sad because, you know, he's he's celebrating you know the biggest achievement of his life so far by beating you know, Sean Porter. But at the same time, I mean, he can't you know he can't go and do what he wants because you got to worry about you know look behind your back at who's you know following you and who in, in your company. I mean. I feel for the guy because he's probably he probably didn't he's he doesn't seem like the guy like a guy who goes out and looks for trouble. Right. He doesn't look like it to me. But then again, who knows? You know, because there's a lot of fighters out there that don't look like it and they're and they're and they're mentally, you know, they're 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 wild and they're and they're you know, they're not you know, they're not they're just not good individuals outside of the ring, but but I can't see it being a thing where him going out and looking for trouble. I I, I think the I think it is it's something to do with boxing, and it just seems like that when you you cut you, you know you you have a, a sport where there's nefarious characters all around. You know, there's there's a lot of jealousy and animosity, and I think you know that could have been the case, but I'm not going to speculate anymore. Um, it's a sad thing, and I hope and I hope he still fights in December. I don't see why he wouldn't fight in December. But then again, who's to say if he'll, he'll fight if, if that that date is now off because of this incident? Absolutely, just uh, hope that he recovers and wishes wish, yeah, well, we, wishes for him. We wish Kell Brook well. You know, yeah. it, he, you know, he's a good guy. He seems like a good guy. You know, he's a good fighter, and I don't think he deserved that. And that same goes for Jamie Moore. They don't. Yeah. They, he, he didn't deserve that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I understand there's stuff that goes on in boxing with with stuff like that, but they don't deserve. It. I mean, I've never heard anything bad about Jamie Moore. I've never heard anything bad about Kel so I, I don't think they I don't think anybody deserves that personally even a regular person doesn't deserve that you know unless they're doing doing the wrong things but I just don't think those two are doing the wrong thing I just think they're in the wrong place at the wrong time and also uh, news broke uh, earlier this afternoon as uh, WBO middleweight champion Peter Quillen decided to vacate the belt he gave it up gave the belt up uh, the interesting news is with this is that um, as those who know who are in the know, or the boxing fans know, I should say, uh, Rock Nation Sports uh, won a purse bid for Peter Quillen, uh, supposed what was supposed to be a title defense for him against ma mandatory contender uh, Matthew Karabov. Um, the fight was they was looking to make the fight happen in November. Um, it was an extension in order to make the fight happen, uh, but apparently it was not going to happen as uh, Quillen decided to uh, vacate the belt. Uh, rumors abound as as to why it's happening. Um, what I'm hearing is that um, Al Heyman, who is uh, Quillen's promoter, um, advised Peter Quillen to give to uh, vacate the belt. Rumors are running rampant. And the reason for that is because that Al Heyman he doesn't want to do business with Rock Nation 
sees them as a threat and decides to advise them to take action and say, I don't want to. And if I is willing to say no to a title defense against mandatory contender, uh, Karabov, the interesting thing here is that uh, this fight was set to be a career high payday for Perry Quillen, who reportedly was turning down, is turning down 1.4 million in order to make this fight happen. Uh, he's moving on. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Kent. Um, I know you're in New York. Uh, Quillen is in New York. Uh, what are you hearing in terms of why? This uh, why Quillen decide to give up the belt? Um, are the rumors true about the tension between Heyman and Rock Nation Sports? And uh, what is Quillen's move here? I'm hearing Danny Jacobs. Um, other, I'm hearing other rumors about a possible fight with Canelo in the future. All I know is is that um, whatever he does, let's hope he, he better get paid handsomely because on the surface, to me, it doesn't seem to be a smart move. Uh, why turn down $1.4 million, a career-high payday? Look, Rock Nation, did they overbid for the fight? Yeah. But so what? That benefits you. You get paid a lot of money. So why would you turn down that kind of payday against a guy I think you can beat? From what I'm hearing, uh, it's a situation where Heyman and Rock Nation sports are just not going to work together. There's a lot of, you know, history between them, especially between Al Heyman and Beyonce. Anybody who wants to know anything about that, they can look, you just search it, you know. I'll just give you the, the short the short version. The crib, no, the crib notes is um, Al Heyman, Beyonce sued Al Heyman over, over, money she wasn't paid for concerts. And, and for those who don't know, uh, before um, Al Heyman got into the boxing business, he was a pretty, he was a very prominent uh, concert promoter. Yes, he was. He was quite, he was a big name in, in the concert or in concert promotion world. Um, you know, and, I, and even today, I think he still do, does concerts every now and again. Um, but that's where he made his money. That's where he made all his money is in the concert promotion business. Um, you know, and, but I I think it stems from that. I mean, I don't blame Al Heyman for want, not wanting to work with Rock Nation. I mean, would you work with somebody that has somebody involved? Like, uh, you know, even though it's not directly involved, but somebody affiliated with that camp that sued you, I don't think you would want to work with people like that. No reason to. I mean, the, the bridge has already been burnt. Why would you Why would you uh, want to do that? Um, but at the same time, I could see why they, turned, they, they, they moved on and they dropped the belt. But yeah, it was a big payday for Quill. It was going to be the biggest payday of his career. He was going to get over a million dollars. Um, but that's what I'm basically hearing on that. It's just simply that Rock Nation and Heyman will not do business on the surface, it looks like. And Rock Nation is going to pursue other options, you know. It still looks like Karabov's in that fight, and the fight is still on. You know, for to, for that, for the, it's just finding an opponent for the vacant belt, um, and maybe finding another location. You know, for the time being, maybe it's still at Barclays. Who knows? But right now, it, it's just a situation where people won't do business with each other, and you know, it's because of you know stuff that happened years ago, and. I understand why, they, like I said, I understand why, but at the same time, I, I don't, I, I mean, if you, there has to be a really good reason to turn down that payday. Yeah, and, and I find, because, and I kind of, I, like I said, it makes no sense. It makes no, even, even if this rumor about against the Canelo Alvarez is going to be happening in the future, why not beat uh, Karapov? You make that money, and then you can make even more money in a fight versus uh, a Canelo. Or, or even a Denny Jacobs. I'm yeah. sorry, you, you you take that kind of payday. I don't care if if, if they overpay for the bout. They the fools. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You're not the idiot. They're the idiots for overpaying. Okay. Um, but I, 
if the the only reason I can see him turning this fight down because there's a there's a bigger plan. I, I, I suspect there's a bigger plan. It better be. And, and that's the only thing I could figure. It's a bigger plan for, for, for Quillen down the line. Maybe he's gonna get paid more to fight Danny Jacobs. I can't see it. I mean it's possible. Anything with Al Heyman is possible. You know? <laughs> Who thought we were going to see Danny Garcia versus Rod Salva? <laughs> you know, anything's possible with Al, you know, and I'm an Al fan, but, I mean, unless they have a bigger payday in store for him for Jacobs and then the, 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 the icing on the cake, which would be Canelo, then, you know, then I can understand. So, so I'm just curious to see how this plays out. Um, but... On the surface, it doesn't look like a, a, a good move, but like I said, they're just not going to work together. They refuse to work together. They're not going to work together. You know, Rock, you know, I knew Rock and, and, and Al Heyman, they're not going to work together. They're, they're, it, they, it's just not going to happen. And I, and I kind of had known that, you know, as soon as the purse bid was made, I knew that they, were gonna, they weren't going to work together. And and it, and it surprised me that they even you know put the you know put up that type of money for a fight that wasn't going to happen. So yeah, absolutely. So again, like I said, for me, um, you don't you don't you don't turn that kind of money down. I don't care. Uh, and I just hope that there's bigger plans uh, moving forward for Billy Quillen because personally, I don't see it, which makes me question again why why. Why did you turn down one point four million dollars, particularly against a guy that you can beat? And I'm a guy, and I'm 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 the dude who's been very critical of Peter Quillen. I don't think he can beat Triple G. Um, there are other middleweights who I don't think he can beat. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of the top super middleweights he can beat, but he can beat this guy. So what you do is you fight him, you make that money, and then you move on to another bigger fight, which makes you even more money. So again, it, it makes no sense to me. Let's move and, on. And Go ahead. I was just gonna say, even though I think he would beat Karabov, it wasn't a guarantee either. It was a 50-50 fight, maybe 60-40 fight. You know, it wasn't like it was a guaranteed victory, but at the same time, it was a very winnable. It was a winnable fight for Quan. Yeah, I, I don't want to sound money hungry here, but again, this is this, this is boxing. Nothing's guaranteed. Uh, this this sport is shaky. It's shady. Uh, full of sharks, and when you get when you get that kind of money off, offered to you when you haven't had it before, uh, dog on it, you take it. Let's move on to uh, do preview uh, of the weekend's action. The very big weekend, and really the next week. <coughs> I think the next two Excuse weeks me. are going to be so. Loaded. Excuse me. The next two weeks are going to be loaded. They are going to be absolutely loaded. I mean. Even next, you know, next week the boxing kicks off on Thursday, <laughs> so it, it, it's it's a very very big big next couple of weeks for boxing. And yes. it, yeah, this week you have, you know, well you explain to them. Yeah, the next two weekends in particular, as far as I'm concerned, that's, uh, this is a big, the next two weekends coming up. Next two weeks coming up are going to be the most. Um, the best week, best two weeks of the year as far as I'm concerned in the sport. Outside uh, of maybe November. Outside right. of maybe November. I could make an argument that it is, that it's bigger, but we're gonna save that for another day. Let's talk about uh let's kick things off talking about a uh, big flyweight fight happening tomorrow. Uh be tomorrow morning our time since this fight is happening in Japan. Look, you know, and, and trigger warning, we're about to get into some real boxing nerd I'm here. Um, some boxing geek talk here. Um, I've, I've said it before and I've said it again, when it comes to the Pound for Pound Box Report, when it comes to my show, blog, all that stuff, I think one of the things that uh, separates us from other shows is that we will talk about the smaller guys, we will talk about the Mighty Mice, and um, this fight coming up in Tokyo is going to be huge, it's Akira Yagashi defending his WBC uh, flyweight belt against uh, former strawweight junior flyweight champion Roman Gonzalez. Uh, Yagashi, he's also a former uh, strawweight champion. Uh, terrific bout. Um, one of the better fights, one of the better matchups that's been made in 2014. Uh, quick assessment of this fight. Uh, 
I, as I will say right now, this fight is going to be good. It's going to be real good. Um, I think this is going to be guaranteed action. Both fighters will not back up. This will be a pretty much a war. Um, but for me, uh, Yagashi, he's tough. He's strong. Uh, he's not a big puncher, but he's very solid. He, has, he takes a really good punch. But to me, uh, Roman Gonzalez is one of the best fighters in the world, pound for pound. I got him on my, on my top ten list. Uh, and I think um, EJ of Errol of EJ Boxing Live has joined us, and we will bring him into the discussion. But I'll go to you on this one, Ken. Uh, talk about this fight with Yagashi and Gonzalez, uh, and talk about the overall landscape when it comes to the smaller guys to fly away, because it's this fight and another fight that's going to be happening in Flyway um, on Saturday. Uh, just really showing, as far as I'm concerned, why Flyway is one of the best boxing in the division and probably the most slept on division in boxing right now. Yeah, I think this is going to be a very, very good fight. Uh, I think it's going to be action-packed throughout. Um, let's just say they're, they're not, there's not going to be any boxing involved in this. This is going to just be offense, offense, offense. Um, we got, you know, Roman Gonzalez, 39-0 with 33 knockouts versus Akira Yagashi, the defending, you know, WBC, uh, WBC, right? Yeah, I'm just yeah WBC champion. WBC um, flyweight champion who's twenty and three with ten knockouts. Um, it's 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 a it's a it's a styles fight. It's a it's a well matched fight um, against two guys that are willing to go in into trenches and go to war. Um, personally, I think we're gonna have a fight where um, you know Gonzalez is gonna come out. And try to push the fight, in, in you know, on the inside, and I think Yagashi is gonna oblige him, because that's usually how Yagashi fights, and I think that benefits Roman Gonzalez because he's a stronger guy. He punches a lot harder. Um, he he can go to the body, you know. He can you know he can you know just beat you up and rough you up and get you against the road ropes and pound on you, and and I think that's gonna be the key to the fight. I think. It's not going to be a boxing match. I mean, there's ways Yagashi can win um, if he had just stays on the outside of box, but I know he ain't going to box because he only knows one way, and that's coming forward, and that's the way Gonzalez likes it, you know, rough and mix it up and, 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 and go to war. And I think that Gonzalez ends up winning, you know, a, a wide decision or gets a late stoppage because of the bigger shots. I think he's just a harder puncher. He's a stronger guy, and I just don't think Yagashi's going to be able to hurt him or keep him off. And and I think that's going to be the, the whole key to the fight. And I think that that Gonzalez is just he, he just he just this is just made for him to win. Uh, are you there, Errol? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, man. Okay, we uh, we do. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, um, Arrow from EJ Boxing Live is joining us uh, right now on the show um, as we're doing a preview of what's coming up over the next over the next weekend, really the next week in boxing. And um, we're talking about um, Akira Yagashi defending his WBC flyweight belt against former junior, against former strawweight and junior flyweight champion Roman Chocolito Gonzalez. Uh, and I'll go see you on this one, EJ. We talked about this fight on your show um, earlier today. Uh, give your assessment of Yagashi's uh, fight against uh, Roman Gonzalez. Uh, what scenarios do you see playing out? Oh, look, you, you know, before I get into that, yeah, I know you was just talking about the Cotto and um, the, the Queen Chocolate. I just want to jump into that quickly because you guys was discussing why he did that. I just got some breaking news. The reason okay. why, he, the reason why he did that, yeah, is because he did that because apparently they're going to make a fight between him and Cotto. And the reason why it was more money for him to to, to vacate the bar. I know they really died doing purse bids already. So the reason our Heyman advised him, well, because we've got the cut-off final line, leave that, leave the belt, and we're going to, a, um, so he's going to move up the weight and face cut -off. So let's let you know that's the reason I've heard right now that that's the reason why he vacated his WBO belt to try and get more money to fight uh, Miguel Cotto at middleweight. So that, that's the reason why. And right, we're going to... Um, into uh, the, the Gashi fight and the Gonzalez Wait, wait, wait. Before you go into that, you, you want to get some thoughts on that, Kent? About uh, Quillen moving up. You know up. what? If there's more money involved in a Kodo fight, I don't really blame him. 
then because if they if he's going to get maybe 2 or 3 million out of the Cotto fight maybe um, it matters a square garden it's more money yeah there is more money no i agree with that absolutely if if you can get the money there absolutely go for it if it's a, if and because you're facing the man in the division I have no problem with that. If you if you're guaranteed more money fighting the the main man in the division, then go right ahead. You know, yeah. Yeah, the Russian guy would have been a tough tough um would have been a tough out for him. You wouldn't have got no more money. But this fight is a super fight. And yeah, that that scenario, okay, now I can understand. That scenario makes sense. That scenario right there makes that's sense. Wow. Heyman, and that's how Heyman's about the money. Always about making more money for his fighters, and that's why that's happened. So the Roman yeah. guns. Okay, can I talk about um, Yagashi and Gonzalez? Oh, yeah, the Roman Gonzalez fight and the Yagashi fight, man. That's going to be a great fight. Um, stylistically, both of them, they both come forward. Um, they Gonzalez, I've been watching him train. I've been, I found a YouTube channel of a guy following him from Nicaragua, and I've been looking at his training. The guy looks superb. He's over in Japan mixing with the food. He's at his weight. He's on weight. Um, Agashi, um, Agashi, he looks good as well. I mean, he looks strong. They both weighed in. I see the press conference, so everything's all set. And um, they will see them trying the gloves out. And you know, I'm, I'm every. And you know what? Most of the forums, you know, they they're actually bringing. This is actually getting some steam right now. Getting some headway. A lot of people are talking about it. I know we talked about it today, but a lot of people in the boxing world are actually paying attention to this fight. A lot of people are anticipating it's going to be one of the fights of the year. And I'm thinking it's going to be probably one of the fights of the year because there's no, they, like. Stylistically, they match so they match so well. And out of this, if he was to win this fight, Chocolito would become a three weight champion, tying with, a, with his fe uh, fellow countryman Alexis Arguello in terms of like weights, three weight champion. So this is there's a lot on the line. Agashi, if he was um, Aguero Agashi, if he was to win this fight, it'd be well, he's big for Japan, massive to, to knock out uh, one of the top guys in pound for pound in the division. And also we got like the, the young Anuki on the undercard. He's there as well, so there's there's other fights in there. I know for you know of Estrada, there's so many for all the best guys in the flyweight division are fighting each other. But this fight stylistically is gonna be like there's it, it, no bad thing to say about it. I've got um uh, I think Chocolate will probably win on points, man. I, I I'm trying to show respect for the champion that he's not gonna be stopped. As I see his last fight and he was taking a beat and then he turned around the fight and knocked the guy out with a big uppercut. So. I'm going to show respect to the champion, but but both champions anyway. But I'm going to say Chocolito is going to win um, by your nice decision. But what a fight, bro. Like, if anyone that like, you need to, like, stream, wherever you need to find it, um, I'm going on Twitter. I'm just leaving my Twitter thing open with um, Agashi and Gonzalez or Chocolito versus Akira and, and try and find that stream wherever, wherever it comes. But you, you just don't want to miss this fight when it happens, man. So, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's going to be a war. Um, it's going to be a battle early on, but I just think overall, um, Yagashi he gets hit too he gets hit too much for my taste. And um, even though uh, Gonzalez is moving up from 10, 105 to 108 to 112, he's still carrying the power. Um, he's highly skilled, can go to the head and body equally well. And I just think he's going to land too many big shots for uh, Yagashi uh, to handle. I just think he's going to uh, stop him late. But um, as as Errol said, uh, normally I don't advocate streams. Uh, but doggone it, damn it! Uh, have a method. You, whatever way you ha you can you can to watch this fight, whatever you have to do to watch this fight live, doggone it, do it. Uh, it's going to be worth it. Uh, one of the fights of the year, as I um, as I said, I'm going to keep saying, um, whatever you have to do to watch this fight live, do it. Find whatever stream you have to do. Go to Twitter. Uh, reach out on social media. Find whoever you have to to watch this fight because it will be worth it. Um, on the undercard of Igashi and Gonzalez. Features uh, newly crowned WBC Junior Flyweight Champion, Naoya Anui. Uh, I'm, I said it on Arrow's show, and I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to you on this one. I think Anui is uh, quite possibly the best young fighter in the world. Uh, offensively, there's, some, there's nothing he cannot do. Uh, he can stand outside and box if he wants to. Uh, he can fight inside. He can counter. Uh, he has an educated left hand. Power in both hands can go up, can go equally, can hurt you and knock you down um, equally to the head and body with both hands. He has a solid defense. He can be hit, but I think a product of that is a product of him being young. He's only 20 years old. 
uh, explosive guy. I've said it before. Uh, I think he reminds me of a young Shane Mosley during his lightweight days. Um, I think he has the potential to be a star, a sensational prospect. Even though he's a world champion, I still consider him a prospect because he's so young. Just a terrific talent. Um, he's fighting a, a Thai fighter by the name of Koiki Jim. Um, I look at this fight to me, this is a showcase fight for um, Anui. Um, looking at Koiki Jim's uh, record, nobody with distinction on his record. Um, and I think that Anui, he should, he should really impress and really display all the talents and all the skills that has me, has me raving about him. Definitely, man. I agree, man. Uh, he's, he's he's definitely there, man. He's definitely there, and they got the on this. What I'm saying, this Japanese card is is stacked, man. They got some guy. They even got a middleweight guy in the, in the card as well, who's who's making um he's going to get. But then the the tie fire he's fighting. I I know you're saying this should be a showcase, but this is durable dude, man. Like he only ever been stopped once, so I'm expecting this fight to go some rounds. But Anuki, like you said, man, man, that's what they call him, the monster. That's his nickname. His next name is the monster, man, and the monster Anuki, and bro, he hits like a monster, and he's got great, good foot movement for what I saw, and the way he beat the champion, um, he, the way he beat the champion Hernandez, man, he, 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 he bro, he, he looked like he was in the shower and he never got wet. So my thing is, um, Anuki should be good, and also look, people be thinking about it, depending on how Roman Gonzalez and Anuki think, thinking maybe down the line them two will probably get it on, but right now, man, Manu, uh, Anuki, the monster. He's, he's just uh, he's on a roll right now. We're gonna see where he goes. Like you said, he, he's a novice. He ain't had that many fights, but he's a champion. It's, it's just one of them things there. But he's that good. So um, I'm expecting Nuki to win by decision. I'm not expecting him to stop this dude, man, because uh, this dude here look real tough. So um, it should be a good fight. And Nuki, watch out for Nuki, man. That guy, that guy is gonna be one. Give me a name. He's gonna be a big name, and, and you heard it first in the Pound Fan Boxing Report over here that he's gonna be a name that you know eventually. Hopefully, uh, the way he fights, the way I see it, pound for pound, um, he'll probably, probably be ranked in the pound for pound um, ranking soon. Sometime yeah. soon. I, I, you said you think he's going to go to the decision. I just don't see it. I think he's going to stop him, and I think he's going to stop him in an impression fashion. Uh, talk about this fight with his quirky gym. Um, Ken, and, and am I wrong for being for hyping um, Anui up too much? Or, or 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 am I right here? And do you see him just being a potential star? Because I saw him and I compared him against um, Ioka, particularly their amateur success. Um, and to me, uh, Anui was another level to Ioka. I think he's another level early on in his career as a professional as well. Yeah, we got you know Naoya Anui. He's six and zero with five knockouts versus Smartleck. Kokia Jim, who's 17, 4, and 1 with five knockouts. A um, little bit of information on the tie. Um, his best win was against a faded and old former world champion, Muhammad Rahman, um, in a six round fight. Um, everybody else he's fought and he stepped up against, he's lost. Um, he was stopped in nine rounds by former world title challenger Denver Cuella. Um who we've seen, you know, before, and... Hey, Quayle, who was, yeah, he was beaten by a Ch the Chinese uh, fighter who... And I was... I was, I was, I was young, and we were... Yeah, I was disappointed really in how basically he basically quit. quit in that fight, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he... Yeah, exactly, so... I'm going to say this right now. I think Inui wins by mid-round mid stoppage. I do agree with EJ that I think it's going to go a couple rounds... It's not going to be like a quick stoppage. I think it goes some rounds. The guy seems like a tough guy, even though he he's a you know he's lost every time he stepped up, you know, except the old faded um, former crew uh, strawweight champ. And I just think it's going to go some rounds. He's going to be game. I think the tie. But at the end of the day, I just think uh, Inoue breaks him down and stops him in the middle rounds. Um, I wasn't going to mention this fight, but. Uh since both of you are on. Let's talk about the third fight of this triple header. Uh, Ryota uh, Murata, um, middleweight who fought in the 2012 Olympic Games. He's going to be fighting, uh, look, on record, it looks like it's not a, a, a great opponent uh, based on his one loss, uh, based on a recent performance. But I think Adrian Luna, uh, based on the fights, what I've seen, look, Adrian Luna, he was locked out in one round uh, not too long ago. 
But when you look at his overall record, uh, solid guy. And I'll go to you on this one, Ken. Speak about um, Murata, not just necessarily this fight, but um, his level of opposition um, early in his professional career. You see so many guys fight these uh Fight is the fight easy competition. Let's just see. Let's just say the pad that records up. I don't see that with Murata. Uh, I look at this fight and his other fights previously. Uh, I'm impressed with the level of opposition early on in his career. Yeah, he's not. You know, to be honest with you, no, Murata's not fighting. You know, tune-up fights. It's, it's like real tune-ups against like professional paid. You know, opponents in boxing. He's he's fighting guys with winning records. Guys with quality records, very very good records. You know they're no slat. They you know they're no they're no easy pushovers. Okay, and yeah, I looked at Adrian Flores. He, he he's seventeen and two with, with one draw with eleven knockouts. Um, uh, um, Murad is four and zero with four knockouts. But the but the thing that stands out to me. Is like Murata's level of opposition. He fought, his first fight was against Akio Shibata, who's who's a really experienced guy, and he's only lost a, you know, a good level of competition. He, he had, you know, he fought. We we seen him fight Carlos Nascimento on on a, uh, Unamas, and he destroyed him. And that's a pretty tough guy, um, from Brazil, who is I believe 29 and three or 29 and four. Um, but he's fought a really good level of competition early, and and Flores is not. It doesn't look like a bad fighter. He's got a lot of you know wins against some you know softer opposition, but he looks to be a solid fighter. He looks to be a solid you know a solid opponent for this level, you know at, at, at the stage that Murad is at right now. And I think it'll be a decent fight. I think I think uh, I think Murata stops him. But I think it's going to be a fair. It's going to be. A, uh, it's not going to, you know, be a quick stop. I think it'll go a couple rounds, maybe three or four rounds, and I think Murata stops him, like that, which is basically, you know, his mo as of at recently. And you know, he's. He, it's a. It's a good fight for Murata to keep the, to keep it keep the wins going, and any any he, and he's looked good so far. And I want. I can't wait to see him, you know, progress as a pro because I think he's a really good fighter, and I think. I wouldn't be surprised if you see him be a world champion. I think he's going to end up on a lot of those uh, Macau cards once he's really, you know, groomed and on this level and, and gets to, to near a title. I think you're going to see him a lot on those cards. Uh, let's, I'll go to you on this one, Errol. Let's keep the flyweight theme going here. Look, uh, Kira Yagashi, he has the ring magazine belt uh, because he beat the man who beat the man who beat the man. Um, you got Ramon Gonzalez who on my list is one of the top 10 pound for pound fighters in the sport. Uh, but the name that we're not mentioning here is within the flyweight landscape is Juan Francisco Estrada, uh, who at the end of the day may well be the best flyweight in the world. I mean, look, people will look at me and say, what are you talking about? Uh, this is the same Estrada who lost to Roman Gonzalez back in November 2012. Well. If you look well, at the fight, he, right he, now, anybody who says that didn't watch the fight and how right, had it in that fight. Right, was. because Estrada, he gave Roman Gonzalez hell that night. Um, Gonzalez barely beat him. Uh, one of the fights of the year in 2012. And um, Estrada, went, he moved on from that loss to uh, handle uh, Brian Valora, Valoria impressively over in Macau. Uh, not only beat him, but beat him up has made a couple uh, title offenses subsequently. And I'll go to you in this one, Errol. Um, Estrada, he has a fight coming up Saturday night uh, in Mexico City, uh, another damn good fight against a former junior flyweight champion, Giovanni Segura. Uh, look, this is going to be another corker. Look, Estrada, he's the better boxer. He's the better mover. Um, Segura is limited, but the one thing Giovanni Segura can do is he can he bang. Can he can really, really punch one of the hardest punches in the sport. Um, this has the potential to be another corker. Uh, your thoughts on this fight between Estrada and Giovanni Seguro, EJ? Yeah, that should be a good fight. You know, it should be a good fight. Like, 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 like you mentioned, you got um, Roman Gonzalez, um, Luke, uh, Akira, and um, Giovanni, uh, Giovanni thing. You got like all these guys here. Yeah, these are all top guys in the family. That's why it's interesting. Like these, all these guys are fighting each other. 
And, and we got um, the TIE Fighter Run Roy, who, who, will, who we will talk about in a little bit as well. Yeah, like, they're, they're all, these are all top fighters in, down in the flyweight division, and they all, like, get together and make great fights down there, and, and they're, you know, they, they're carrying that division. Right there. You know, like, I wouldn't even never say that before until I started following, like, I, I started looking out some of these fights because I was so uh, despondent about, like, the rest of the division, about, you know, you got the so-called fights and some of the fights that you have to go down there because division, there's so many divisions in boxing. If you cut and they're, they're, they're televised, only if they're not in English. But these guys right here in the flyweight division and this fight here, is, he's a good fighter, man. Like, I mean, look, in the day, that's how you make your name. He, he gave Roman Gonzalez the hardest fight of the day and, and, and now, now he's got two belts. So it's proven, like, he's up there. So, you know, in the day, like, this fight here, um, the, the opponent he's facing is, is a tough opponent again. Like, you know, this is not no easy fight, you know. It, the, the guys in the flyweight division, I guess it's like maybe probably like the, um, the 60s or something like that where they're not making that much money, where they have to fight each other. There's no excuses down there where you conduct this guy and that guy. Well, if you don't fight this guy, you're not going to make no money. So you have to fight these guys for the belts. He's got two belts, and he beat Vlad Valores, you, you know, who beat um, Tyson Marquez. And now he's got two belts. Now he's making his own claim. In Mexico for to being a tough guy, and like you said, he gave him a hard fight. But um, I got it. he should win this fight here. He should win this fight here. But this is no layup. This is no easy fight. Um, another thing as well, you just talking about Marat, um, the middleweight from Japan as well. I just cover that because um, um, this guy here to me, man, he seems to me he, he he's big. I don't know what what he's been doing, but he's 28 years old, man. To me, he's old. Like he said, like this is his fifth fight. He's fighting a guy here, Adrian Adrian Flores here. Yeah. Um, he's been around for a bit. At least he's been fighting. He's been active and busy. Yeah, I know yeah, he's, he's, he's an Olympian. Lost. That's why he kind of got off to a, a, a late yeah, start. Yeah, a... That, that, that means that means he didn't want to turn pro. So you know his goals were trying to get gold in the Olympics. So the reason why he's turned it is a second after four. But this is what I'm saying to you. He's a middleweight, and he's just, uh, just like in Asia. The last, like I said to Michael, or the last Asian middleweight, the last Asian middleweight to do anything was um, um what's his name again? The one who beat um. Kirkland, what's his name? The one who beat Lang, what's his name again? Not Kirkland, the one who beat, uh, the one who beat, what's it, Akira, not Kira, what's his name again? Mish Mishida, the one who knocked out Kirkland. That's the last, like, Japan Japanese guy at that weight. They don't really do well at these weight swings. So, and for me, it's old. Like, if you want to do something, do anything, I think it's a novelty. He's just going to probably win a couple of fights, maybe try for a bout, but I don't, I don't expect anything from him. It's just making up on the card. Like, I can't see this guy doing anything. You know what I mean? No, you not even. This is gonna be a good test for him, though, right? But um, for me, I can't see anything other than that. But the Jiro Car fight versus um, the one, 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 one Estrada fan, that should be good, man. And, and I see, like, look, that's another competitive fight. I like the idea these guys are fighting, and this is another thing for the fight fans watching here, yeah, watching this podcast and listening right now. This is a different fight you need to watch some Saturday because you, if you don't get your feel out of the Broner fights and the other fights, you definitely gonna get your feel out of that one. That little one's gonna be a cracker, man, for real. So that's what I gotta say on that, man. You gonna say something, Kip? Go ahead, Kip. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, you know, the thing with with I I just think what Marauder is, they're doing the right thing with him. They're they're not messing around. They're trying to get him quickly. Oh, to... He's twenty. I don't understand the Olympics, but he's twenty eight years old, bro. Yeah, I know. They if they're gonna if they're gonna do something, they have to do it quick. That's the whole point. Yeah, but this is the thing. Like, you see the thing about it's not like he's a heavyweight. A middleweight around that thing, like you said, if his goals were to 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 get the thing, like did he achieve it? May probably I don't know if he got gold or whatever. But the bottom line is, yeah, like in this sport, you try and do things young. It's a dangerous sport. It's not the sort of thing you want to take half-heartedly. Look what happened to JD on Love the other day against thing against Porky Paul Paul Medina. This is not the sort of sport where you come in. Ah, oh, let me just give it a try because I think my, you know, you know what I mean. But you know what? Over in Japan, you can do that because you know they have a big crowd. It's a lot of money, and Japan, they don't care if you win or lose. They just care as long as you entertain. So you can do that over in Japan, but the moment you come, you cross the group, you cross over into the U.S. square, or you go to the U.K. market, you're in trouble because the middleweight down there, they're stacked. There's Golovkin and some of them dudes down there, and, you know, I don't know how long he's going to take before he gets on the world scene, to be honest with you. I'm not really, to be honest with you, focusing on that dude, like, um, until he fights someone, but... I, I just don't see him doing anything, but you know. Yeah, well, I'm not. I can see why you would say that. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I I think you know, 
for what it's worth, I mean, at least they, you know, at least they know that they can't waste any time with somebody who's 28. You know, you can't waste any time, and you have to do something with somebody like that. But this Segura, um, Estrada fight, I like this fight actually. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is this is this is a, a not a very easy fight for Estrada, um, because the thing with with Segura is he, he he's an aggressive guy. He's busy. He throws punches and he and he hits hard. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think he's a little too crude. Um, I think uh, Estrada is a much better boxer. You know, much more polished. Um, I think uh, Estrada wins a decision. You know, but I think it's going to be you know Estrada is going to have his moments in the fight where it gets dicey because you know because Segura is just nonstop pressure. He pressures you. He makes you work. No matter if he wins or loses, he makes you work for if to win for if you're gonna beat him. Mm. So that 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 may, it makes it a great styles fight because it's a boxer against a guy who puts on a lot of pressure and can punch. And that and that's gonna you know that's that's a real crowd pleasing fight, you know. And, and and that's what see this is the thing with a lot of these little guys is people don't understand like people don't pay attention to them, but you gotta understand a lot of these guys. They they fight the best guys, but they get paid nothing. You yeah, know, they get paid right. very very little for for their for their hard work. You know, so, <laughs> so they have to you know they have to work they have to work ten twenty even fifty times harder in the ring to to get people to pay attention to them. Yeah, they don't absolutely. If, if you, because if you don't work hard enough, no one's going to pay attention to you. So that's why they fight. They try to fight the best because they want to show people. That we're worth watching. We, we, you know, we, we're worth, you know, paying money to. You know, yeah. you're, we're worth putting on TV. And, yeah, that, and I think that's why they, you know, they get paid very little, but they work so hard in the ring and, and put on a great show that, you know, they, 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 they have a lot to, to fight for. That's, yeah, but that's, that's the sad thing in the, in the, in the inequity um, of the of the sport uh, when it comes to fighters like this. The, the the only way they can really get paid is maybe if they fight in Japan. Uh, where they pay well, uh, but other than that, um, it's a case of they develop faster, um, they're more skilled, they bring more entertainment to, uh, in the ring in terms of television and all that, but yet they don't get paid nearly uh, the money. They get paid chump change. They get peanuts, change. man. They get paid chump compare, compare to bigger fighters who, who don't bring action, who bore, who are boring, um, yeah. and, and, and seemingly uh, don't have the passion in or out of the ring, if these fighters fight, uh, carry, have I should say. This is, yeah. what saying. This, this is what I'm saying about Estrada, right? And this is what this is why you you pay attention to. Not only did he have a hard fight with Gonzalez, yeah, but the thing is, the guys picked up two belts. And I was saying to Michael earlier on, this is how you make a name for yourself. Let's say like Ricardo Lopez, you you not only get two belts, but you clean up in your division. You can't, but yeah, not recognize the undisputed. Uh, Whatever division you say, anyone gets all the belts in the division, you cannot like just brush that guy apart like the glitch school. Everyone knows who he is in boxing. He's got all the belts. Like if this guy Estrada, this guy, this guy Estrada, he's got two of the major belts. He picks up another one, and you're like, okay, he's got all three belts. Why not pay him attention? That's what I'm saying about Anuki right now. He's young, but if he can do it right now because he, he's big for the weight, pick up all the belts in the division and challenge the guys and the champions because that's how you make your money and that's how. We pay notice to them. Gonzalez as well, he's challenging himself. Three weeks, this is his third weight. He's challenging himself. They have to do this year. If they don't try and go for greatness like Harry Henry Armstrong, we're not going to pay attention to them. So, you know, I applaud all these little guys, but to be honest with you, that's what they have to do to make the money. Right. Well, they have to. I just want to jump in. That the reason why they have to get make the money is because they have to continually fight the best because people... That, see, like even though Estrada is known amongst boxing fans as a two-way, you know, two-belt champion at flyweight, the thing is, nobody's still no, but he, and he's starting to get some buzz. I will admit that he's starting to get some buzz, but the people that need to care still don't care. <laughs> you know, you see what I'm saying? They, they still don't get it. Like they no, still. No, but you see the thing about me, you, and the rest of the guys here. We know who he is here from what he put on. But the thing is to go, I know who will brand the Hawaiian punches. So he's taking names. And what I'm saying is that that's how you establish yourself if you want to be great in this era. A lot of guys don't do that. 
you clean out your division. It, it's, it's, it's easy. If you can do it, like Broly could have done that when he was there at Lightweight. He could have just done it. He could have just stood there. He said, nah, I want to go up. I want to challenge him myself. And now he's in hard fights, right? But he could have made it easy for himself. And Estrada is doing it. He's grinding himself out. And at the end of the day, when your legacy is said and done, they remember what you did. They remember what you when you what you went through. Even when you even when you're past your best, they remember this guy went out there and, and, and tried to do greatness. And that's what you'll be recognized for. The little guys down here, that's what they're doing here. You got Estrada, you got a new key, it looks like obviously he's headed for greatness, and you got Gonzalez as well. And even uh, uh, Shiro, uh, uh, Shiro Gashi. I like that little dude, man. He might make a name for himself. What if he knocks out Gonzalez? Then you gotta put him in there, you know what I'm saying? So Right, shot. right, and even even a guy like like see the thing also um in the little divisions is a loss doesn't really mean anything like you know what I'm saying it doesn't it doesn't valid invalidate you like because they're always fighting the best that's why yeah. that's why that's, it's not as bad. Yeah, that's right. Well, that, that's it. Well, they, like I said, we like we said they have to fight each other. If they don't fight each other, boy, they're not going to make that money. And the thing is, this is why we're paying attention when the rest of the divisions is slacking. The flyweight division is, is, is carrying boxing. And HBO and Showtime, to be honest with you, you know, the networks are carrying all the main fights. But they, they should pick up these fights. These fights are cheap. They don't cost that much. Back in the early, in the 80s, they used to cover all these guys back here. Carbajal, they used to cover... Um, they used to cover Lopez. They used to cover all these little yeah, guys. Yeah, look, remember when Showtime used to cover uh, Ricardo Lopez? Like, yeah, they used to cover yeah. Well, you know what? We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a social media time right now. It's lucky that when the fight comes on, when I, I can download it and I can com do commentary on it and maybe some English people could watch it because that's the only reason why people – that's their excuse, right? Oh, it's in, it's in Japanese. It's in another country. It's in Spanish. I mean, well, what? I translate. Listen, listen, listen. It doesn't matter what language it is. If you can see what's going on in a ring, it shouldn't matter. That's right. what people, that's what people, some people's excuse would be. So what I'm saying to you is that, end of the day, when you used to watch them fights when they were in different countries, you had someone English speaking it. If they get English, I'm not trying to say I'm the main thing, but any with social network, this is how it is. You you, you just blatantly download it and just put it in another, put it in your language, and this then then they will look like most of the guys when I uploaded some of them little guys, most of my people who follow me, they'll they'll watch it. They're like who's that? Oh oh, he's all right. You know what I'm trying to say? So that's how things are. With social media, with Chocolito, this is how things grow until eventually, like, oh, how did I not miss this guy? You know, that's how legends grow, you know what I'm saying? So they're on the they're on the great, um, verge of greatness. So we're just trying to try and of course, because the other divisions right yeah, now. Yeah, but see, see, back then, we didn't see, back then, like, Ricardo Lopez didn't have, didn't have the luxury of people being on social media to get his name out there. He had to fight for everything he had. Hmm. Mm, you see what I'm right. saying? No, right. and even at the end, towards the end of his career, people still didn't know who he was. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. I mean, look, end of the day, these guys here, boxing, you, our sport is not like, like the world thingy sport right now, right? We, 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 you know, we love our sport, but we still, our sport is still in the thing. Like until the heavyweights emerge, a great heavyweight emerges to take over boxing. we we're, we're the, the the world awaits are, are carrying boxing, and they don't want to fight each other, or so they make excuses. But even saying that, Mayweather is the highest paid, uh, highest paid one, of the most highest paid in the world, and everything he says or anything he does gets the world news. So boxing is still there. It just takes uh, one of them guys. But in the meantime, we can, we can, we can cherish and watch these little guys. They're giving us what we want. For me, they're giving us what I want, and out there, oh, yeah, they're giving us everything that we that a lot of the guys should be, you know, given. Yeah. You know, yeah, right yeah, now. We, yeah, go on. I was gonna say we want to have a we have to have in the future a discussion about um, that about the heavyweight division why it gets so much attention and why the other fighters don't. But we're gonna move on because we're a little bit pressed with time here. Uh, uh, Card on Showtime this weekend. Adrian Broner is gonna be fighting Emmanuel Taylor. Lucas Matisse is gonna be fighting Roberto Ortiz. Andre Berto returns to the ring to fight uh, Steve Chambers. Uh, talk about Broner here and Taylor, and I'll go to you on this one. Um, Errol, since you said you saw some video of Broner in training, uh, look, they had a little press conference today where uh, Broner uh, kind of mushed um, Emmanuel Taylor in the face. And, and the fact that he did not respond in the way that I thought he should have, that lets me know all I need to know about Emmanuel Taylor. Look, Broner, he gets on my nerves by how he acts outside the ring. I'm not impressed by how he's fighting inside the ring lately. Uh, but I don't know if Emmanuel Taylor has that dog in him, has that toughness in him to, to really uh, give uh, Broner a, a good fight. And plus, 
I don't like this way his corner and folk, his corner, um, his handlers are talking about how they're going to fight um, Adrian Broner, talking about how they're going to box him and whatnot. You don't do that against Adrian Broner. You pressure him. So not only I, do I question his kind of, I don't want to question the fighter's heart, but I want to, uh, there's something missing, a spark missing with, Bron with Emmanuel Taylor coming in this fight. And also, I don't like the strategy that they're talking about here. I, I don't, I'm going to step in and say I believe it's a lot of inexperience on Taylor's part and his corner. They haven't been on this stage before. They don't know how to. They don't know how to um, deal with this stage yet. If they ever get back to the stage, I don't know if they will. But it just seems like they did. They just don't know what they're doing. Like they don't. They they're kind of starstruck. They're kind of shocked that they're on this stage. Quickly, your thoughts, Errol? Yeah, man, I saw the. I, I, I'm watching the whole thing on Fight Hype, and then I tell you what, what. What what transpired is is just a lack of disrespect that Brown is bringing. Like to me, the first off, let's talk about his trainer. Now, Mike Stafford, he's his main trainer. He takes him all the way down to Washington, yeah, to get trained by what's his name, Thingy Hunter. What's his name? The one who trains um Peterson. Barry uh, Hunter. All oh, right, Barry Hunter, because Mike who Stafford can't control him. He don't listen in training. And you, I saw them doing pad work, and they were, they were off sync. So he's over there, and and, and um, Thingy Hunter, yeah, is is working. He's got Broner hitting the the belt bag around his waist, and he's trying to get Broner used to pressure. Broner is taking the mick. He's not serious. He's hitting the bag, and he's just joking around, right? Then he comes to like hitting the punt, the the big heavy bag, and he's just yapping away, yapping away. Then yeah, um. You know, he's, he's basically just trying to sell himself still. The dude's not serious. Come to the press conference, he's talking Bronish, where basically he's talking mumbling, and he's got, I think he's bravo or someone who's trying to translate what he's saying. Then he gets up and dry humps the mic, right? He's still on that bullshit. He's really? Still, really? Yeah. He, and he's still on his bullshit. And the reason why um, we're talking about Taylor, what happened with Taylor is Broner was disrespecting him earlier in the day this and his trainer, this and him. Now, Taylor wasn't having it, so Taylor was whispering to him. Then Broner grabs his neck. When he Broner grabs his neck, Taylor tries to advance, but Broner's already out of there quick. And he's talking, and he, you know what I mean? And and what's happened with uh, Taylor, I feel like he's got to his head. I feel like he's got I feel like he's got to his head right now. I feel like, he, he, you know, it's actually affecting the way he thinks. And he's got, yeah, he's got the wrong game plan going into the fight. He said, he, they asked him, are you going to uh, do the same game plan as Marcus McDonough? And he said, no. He said, there's other ways of beating Broner. I'm like, really? That, well, well, that's the most effective. What are you going to do? Are you going to try out boxing? He got the wrong game plan. He, if he, The thing is, he, he seems like he's content to try and win it on points. And and you could see that when he you know when he fought against um, Algeria, when he was down, he just, you know, he, he didn't really advance on anything. So his mindset is basically as, you know, I'm not going to rock the ship. You know, it's like I'm just gonna probably try and last the twelve rounds. I don't know if he feels that he wins, but he's got. But he also said that um, Broner's a lightweight. Yeah, I know Broner's a lightweight, but he and he Broner does look like a lightweight. He bloody, you listen, you see ribs in Broner. He, <laughs> he's gonna make lightweight right now. I'm <laughs> like, why is this dude? Yeah, he's just dumb. He could so dominate the lightweight division, right, and give great fights there. But he's finding the division where he doesn't need to be because he's there trying to chase Floyd money and I think he's he, I think the management and everything is gone out of whack I think his professionalism is gone I don't think he had it in the first place and there's no he's basically in training as well he's basically telling uh telling thingy hunter that nah nah I don't, I'm not on this and I'm not on that he's basically controlling he, he he's training thing and that, that's wrong already he's young and ready and I, I just feel like say this fight is is just going to be a bore and I, I don't I, I you know Brona should win the fight but you know what? I'd, I'd like it if, the, if if Taylor was to upset him. I would because they don't like the way he was disrespecting the guy's trainer, disrespecting him. But that's just Broner. Broner is not boxing on. Broner is is turning into a into a joke show. If you're looking for something to make you laugh, then go to the Broner. And I guarantee in this fight, mark my words right now, he gonna dry hump. He gonna dry hump Emmanuel Taylor. I'll tell you that right now. I'm tell him how you really feel. Right tell him why you're bad, side. Say it with your chest, Errol. Say it with your chest. Let me say, let me say something. Let's uh, one, one minute, one minute, one minute. Another thing he said, right? <laughs> he said, right, in the press conference, right, so now you're worrying about the fight. You're not even talking about how you're going to break the guy down. Bro, so Brown is down the mic, and he's talking about Emmanuel Taylor's trousers. Uh, you call them pants in the States, right? 
Um, he's talking about his pants. He's saying his pants are so tight he can see his ID. I'm like, dude, why are you looking at the guy's tra tra um, pants? Right? <laughs> oh, They're so tight if they see an ID. And just seconds ago, you was humping the mic. Man, I was like, this guy, this guy is border, uh, is border homosexual, man. And like this is this, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, <laughs> oh boy, you, you, you're not even going into the room. You're getting like you want to do sexual acts to the dude, homosexual acts. And he, and you know what? It's scary, bro. I don't like to fight him myself. I wouldn't want to fight Broner. Broner is, is, is <laughs> disgusting, man. It's disgusting. And I, I was the biggest fan of Broner. You don't even understand. I was the biggest fan of Broner prior to when he prior to when um the Mark and, um the the Madonna fight. Madonna fight, I was wrong with him. When I saw him dry hump Madonna from behind, I said, what the fuck's that? What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is that? And then I see him in his next fight, I thought, let me give him a squeeze. He done it again in the, in the fight recently as well. He's there behind the referee goes, what are you doing? He's there. He can't help himself. He enjoys it. If you get behind the room, he's going to try and shag you, bro. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, listen, listen. I'm going to tell you something. Um, I know, but I'm going to tell you. I mean, oh boy. That, that's funny. That's really funny. But I'm going to say this right now. Um, I truly think I'm going to take a turn from the Brits, you know. I really think Broner, with, the, with his career, he's just taking a piss. He really is. He's pissing his career away. Like, he's really done everything to, like, ruin his career. Like, he, he doesn't take it seriously. I've, I, you know... I've heard that plenty of times that he hasn't taken it seriously, and and it's sad when Mike Mike Stafford, who's a great trainer, I think he's a great trainer, um, he's lost control of the guy. That is scary when you've lost control of somebody and you can't you, you can't do anything with them anymore. They won't listen, and you have to bring them to another trainer to get them to listen. But then he doesn't listen to that guy. That's dangerous. That is so dangerous. And and, and you know, I'll be honest with you. I, I I could see Broner in this fight seriously, like making it hit this fight tougher than it should be, because he should win with his skill. He should win this easily, easily. But he's gonna joke around and he's gonna goof around, and somebody's gonna see the fight a draw. I I already know what's gonna happen. Some guy's gonna see the fight a draw, and the other two are gonna have Broner winning. And then he'll, he'll be like, oh, well, the judges didn't know what they were watching. Well, sir, you, you don't do enough in fights. You, you, you don't draw enough punches. You, you, you sit there and you pose and you get hit, and you get hit on, top, on, on the side of the head just like you did against Maidana and then it ended up getting you dropped. He, he, he's, he, he's taking it. Well, like I said, he's taking a piss. He, he doesn't care. He, he's no. just, he's, he, thinks he's, he thinks he's bigger than life, and he's not. He's he's simply not that good of a fighter. Yeah. I mean, it, I, and it's not about his skill. It's about between the ears. You know what I'm saying? He, he's got mush between his ears. He he doesn't care. He doesn't listen. He doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And that's it. He, no. he he's gonna make it the fight tougher. He's gonna win the fight. Okay, I'm gonna predict it right now. Verna wins the fight, but he makes it tougher than it needs to be. Let, let me let me tell you something. What you just said there was nearly head. So I'm watching the fight hype and I'm seeing the trainer. The most thing I, I just watched a Floyd Mayweather uh, train like for two. Hours. It was a three hour, four hour thing on on Showtime, right? And that thing he trained on that thing for no, almost like an hour, fifty minutes, near two hours, nonstop, right? No talking, just basically calling Roger over, getting getting um, Nate Jones over, punching the thing, and he was doing his weight press up, and it was just nonstop. I see Broner yapping. What you just did, nail on the head. He don't throw enough punches in the spot when he was hitting the belt. He was throwing yeah, and he was and and, and thing was, Hunter was walking him down, and he kept like move. You need to see it for yourself here online, right? Because I always like what to see people pre preparing for fights. And he was like trying to move around. I was like, Are you crazy? Like I see Peterson be whacking that belt in as you're getting pressure. You're supposed to hit, 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 spin, keep hitting. Broner hitting it, two punches, three punches, and now, now. I was like, man, you ain't hitting enough punches. Then he goes to the big heavy bag. Throws like five punches, stops, yaps. I'm like, this dude ain't serious, though. But you know what? He's young. He burns off a lot of weight. He still can make lightweight, man. He can still make lightweight. But he's again, not, he's just not disciplined or serious. No, no but in that, lightweight division, in that lightweight division, right, with 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 the, the lack of punching output, he doesn't. He can hit hard enough to affect them guys at lightweight because when he hits them, 
it has that effect. Not at this point. Not at 140. Not at 140. Because this guy he's fighting is going to be up near middleweight. Like, he ought lip, man. It, it, I'm telling you, bro. Like, I won't be surprised if he got upset. He's supposed to win. But I the people betting money right now, man, you want to sprinkle a little money on this one right here and Carl Frampton losing to Kiko Martinez. But we're going to talk about that. Go ahead. Breathe, Arrow. Breathe, brother. Breathe. <laughs> I have to get it in, but otherwise I'll forget, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Breathe. Yeah. Let's talk about, uh, quickly, quickly move on, talk about Matisse and Ortiz. Uh, by the way, I think Broner will win as well, and I agree. I basically agree with both of your assessments that um, he disappoints me, quite frankly, ticks me off because uh, the lack of discipline and lack of control of his career. Quick, do, you think, do you think he does something in the fight to make it tougher than it should be? Yeah, he does. I agree with you, man. I'm not even going to disagree with anything you're saying. He does. He does the, he, do, he does that, yeah, you know he's doing that, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he hits, ah, yeah, yeah. He's still doing that bullshit, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's making some other things as, like, games, like, you're playing your game, and you're like, ah, ah. He's making some other things, man. He's making the whole fight hard from the start, for real. It's, it's it, it, when you called it, what you said, you know, for the punches, he's, look, man, everything you said there, kid, is, is just, just on point. If you think I'm, anyone thinks I'm lying, Check out Fight Hype and check out their last feed. Check out their last 12 videos because they're covering Bruno and they've got Bruno talking. And you tell me if this guy is serious, man. You tell me. Uh, quickly, uh, Matisse Ortiz, uh, any of you guys can chime in. Your thoughts on this, Bell? I think Matisse is going to knock him out in the early So do minute. I. So do I. I think this is just a routine fight for Matisse. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he went out there and tried to rip the guy's head off. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I got Ortiz. I think Ortiz could upset him. Ortiz ain't never lost no more. He ain't gonna lay it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, he doesn't have the. the he doesn't have very good skill. He has worse skill than uh, uh, Matisse. And I, and I've watched him. And and I and I think this is a fight made to order for Matisse. I don't, I, I don't. I don't rate Matisse at all. Cause when I talk to Vivian Harris here, who fought Matisse, he was the first one to say he don't hit that hard. I go, you don't hit that hard. He goes, yeah. He goes, when I was fighting him, he 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 sawed up his eye and beat him. I don't think he hits that hard. I think Matisse, to be honest with you, he he now Peterson, he blew out Peterson. I think Peterson fought the wrong game plan. I'm I, look, man, every when it comes to when it comes to this guy, Matisse, I don't know I don't rate him at all. I, I I'm going with Ortiz just for the fact not because I'm being stupid, I just think say, well, just on his record up, you know, Ortiz looks durable. I just don't see why Ortiz will just let this guy roll him so I'm going to go Ortiz. I'm just going to upset the thing. I'm not jumping on this Matisse bandwagon at all. I was the same one saying, I knew Danny was going to be him. I knew Danny was going to be him because Vivian, Vivian was in the ring with him, right? Vivian told me some inside information about him. He said, like, he don't hit that hard. He was beating him up. He don't, like, when he gets hit, he backs off. The moment you swell up Matisse's face, he's a completely different fighter. He's I agree. I agree. That you saw that in the Garcia fight. I'm saying, this is what Vivian was telling me, right? And Vivian told me that, and I went and watched his fight, and I couldn't believe it. I said, this guy, what? This guy, he's all right when he's a good on top fighter. Now, I'm trying to say, with well, this guy Ortiz, if he'd be able to cut him or swell him, man, you're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to see, uh, you see a living fight. So I'm just, I'm going to go with Ortiz, just for the sake of, he, Ortiz, don't show me that he come over, he's coming over to quit. And if he's not coming over to quit and he's coming to stick it on him, then you know you're going to be in a competitive fight. Like, John Molina looked like he was done from the start, man. I don't think he believed in himself that he could have even won that fight, for real. But I think Ortiz, with his winning record and uh, not really strength of, of competition, but I believe that he may be fresh enough and maybe enough to this, this upset this card, upset him, man. He might be fighting the night for real. Could be, but I doubt it, though, because, you know, you got the Estrada, but that's my um, Andre Berto fighting um, Steve Chambers also on this card. Look, um, <laughs> It, it, Berto should win, but really, Berto should win, but really, as far as I'm concerned, this is his last opportunity. I think he's done as an elite fighter to begin with, but if he want to have any kind of a momentum in his career, um, he needs to win. If he doesn't, he should go ahead and retire. Yeah, I think he'll win this fight. I don't think I don't get any any you know any inkling that that Chambers is going to win. I mean, I mean he's a solid fighter, I, but. This is a fight that Bruno, uh, that that Berto has to win. He has to win. There there's no there is no tomorrow for him. There is none. And I think he's going to go out there and dominate. Um, the thing with with uh, see the thing with, with with Chambers is he was called in like two weeks notice. You know, it wasn't like they had an opponent lined up already. I mean, they they, they signed the contract in with two two weeks before. So. 
I, that's why I think Berto wins because Chambers is probably not fully prepared for the fight, which is which is probably a smart thing on Berto's end. You don't want to have a guy with on you know at full strength for your first fight back in over a year. So I I, I think Berto wins. I think Berto wins by stoppage. Oh, your thoughts, Yeah, well, boy, like, well, the Upshaw's been talking on social media to a lot of guys, and, you know, Upshaw, <laughs> Upshaw, man, I don't think he, I don't think he even believes it himself, man. He over, he moves with Selka. Selka's his number one, his roommate, they rooming together and stuff like that. Who's his roommate? <laughs> Selka. Rob Selka. Wow. You, you, yeah. you, you can't, you gotta be serious. No, no, that's that. No, they're, they're saying I, I don't know what it is. Maybe um, Al Heyman has them all all grouped up together. That's his roommate because I see um, Klaus of boxing interviewing. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, man, it sounds like it sounds like they all room the the Al Heyman opponents together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's over there. He knows he's he like he said he he could make a light. He can basically make a to make a lightweight, around light well away. He's, he, you know, even though he's big, he can make them lights. So he's looking to go back down to them weights anyway. Like you said, he's just filling the thing. He don't, he don't really, he don't really believe in there. He just believes he's gonna. Cause they asked him like in in the interview in the colossal box, and they asked him, "Do you think you're gonna win?" Well, I'm gonna put on a good show. You know what I'm saying, so he, I don't think he even believe, but he's from Philly. You know what I'm saying? He's gonna, he's gonna put up a fight. He said he's gonna. I'm from Philly. I'm gonna put up a fight. But I don't think he even believes he's gonna win. And and with his uh. Six knockouts in twenty in twenty four fights. Listen, he ain't doing anything to Berto, and no. I'm gonna tell you right now, yeah. he, took, he took the same not well. He took the same thing when it came when he fought Eddie Gomez. Same thing. Said he's yeah. come, put on a good show, and 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 the same thing, and 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 the result was obviously Eddie Gomez knocked him out. So that's I'm that's what I'm expecting. I mean, yeah. he's not he's not even in the right weight class. No. Personally, he's never he hasn't fought in the right weight class in quite some time. But this is the thing, yeah. Like you got boxers over there, like you, over here in England, we call them journeymen or just brayers. You just fill in, fill in the thing. From the time you're taking fights at short notice, that you ain't about winning. But the thing is, he get a lot of media attention. And the thing is, what we're not covering is these guys like Soka and Upshaw. When I, when you saw when I saw them in the background, Soka was like, damn, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, because this is live on Google. You see him walking by, it's like, damn, they must be up getting the same money. So they're getting paid. They're getting paid for things, and, and this is prize fighting. But you know he's just there to fill. He's probably gonna get stopped. I don't think he believes in, in, in winning the fight. But, yeah, but, and, I, and I wanted to say, you know, right quick. But I will say about the journeymen in Britain. At least they know their way around the ring. We have journeymen over here that can't even negotiate their way around the ring. Yeah, yeah. Alarm. I'm sorry, that's a um, alarm's neighbor, so hopefully it will get it. Of course, getting broken into. You know, listen, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I'm saying about um his thing, bro. I think you guys saying Berto's done as a lead. I don't think so. I don't think he's done. Even if he lose, if he was to lose his fight, I think they still cut him out. They still cut him out, man. They will still cut Berto out. Like, but his boxing is who you're connected with. Al Heyman and whoever you're connected with, they will still give you shots, man. Like, look, Al Heyman giving shots to uh, what's his name again? Who's the guy who lost, who lost against Stevenson? Um, um, Dawson. Uh, that Dawson, he, he look, man, but he keeps going. Like, they all keep going until you until you can't speak no more. You know what I'm saying? It, boxing is where it is. As a league guy, maybe you're not fighting a big name like this. This is only a 10-round fight. But what I'm saying is that they'll keep, even if he was to lose this fight, they'll still cart him back out. It's just the way things are, man. They'll keep doing until people can't stand you no more, until they have to kind of push you away like Evander Holyfield. If Evander Holyfield was connected to Al Heyman, he would still be fighting now. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on. Um, Saturday and um, Belfast uh, rematch between uh, Kiko Martinez and Carl Frampton. Yeah. Uh, this this fight is for uh, Martinez IBF Junior Featherweight Belt. Uh, Martinez and Frampton fought in 2012, I believe it was. Frampton scored a ninth round uh, stoppage, uh, but Frampton, but Martinez gave. Uh, Frampton, a, a very good fight, the toughest fight of his career. Many would argue he was beating Frampton um, up to the time that he got stopped. Uh, Martinez moved on to win a world title against uh, Romero from Colombia. Uh, made two title defenses against uh, Matabula um, in his home country of Spain. And then he beat uh, Hozumi Hasegawa in Japan. Um, and I'll go to on this one, Eros. This is in your part of the world. Uh, I keep going back and forth on this fight. 
Um, hard to pick the winner here. Sure, Frank, people will say that Frank, that he won the first fight. Um, he's the better mover. He's the better boxer. Um, he can punch. Um, but uh, Kiko Martinez gave him such a tough fight his first time out. And I think he's improved greatly uh, since he won the title against Romero. Um, um, they say a fighter becomes 25% better once he wins the belt, and that seems to be the case with Martinez. Um, on this one, I'm still, even as of right now, I'm still having a hard time choosing a winner here. Uh, your thoughts on the fight, Errol? Man, well, the thing is, yeah, the way the fight is, 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 is done, you understand that these, little, these little things in fighting, you need to understand. Frampton, when he fought Kiko Martinez in the first fight, he was with Eddie Hearn, right? So he was with Eddie Hearn in that fight, and, and in that fight, if you look at that fight, people need to look at that fight. He was on the back foot. Not because, and he doesn't fight, does normally fight on the back foot. The reason why is he knew Kiko was a hard thing. And for me, Kiko was winning them rounds. Now, Kiko got caught coming in, right? As he was trying to throw his punch, and Franklin caught him in, and Franklin was able to take him out. Fine, he won the fight. But this thing, look at what, since Frampton has left Eddie Hurt, right? And, and he, he's with his manager, now promoter, uh, Barry McGuigan. He said, look at his fights, man. He's fought nobody. Two fights had no notable names. Now, that might affect him in terms of his development, in terms of his confidence. Where Kiko Martinez is, like you said, uh, Michael, he's gone from strength to strength over in Japan, you know, beating Mexican, beating African dude. You know what I'm saying? He, his record, it shows that he's been willing to fight the very best. And he's coming into Ireland. Most people would just go off what you remember about Brampton in the past. And that's what I was doing. But I have to go by what, what's in the current because we live in the present. Right, and in the present right now, I'm rolling with I'm rolling with Kiko, and I roll with Kiko in the first fight as well. I say he hits too hard, man. And if he fights the perfect fight, Frank is in trouble. Kiko said something key when the, when they were translating him. They asked him about fighting Frampton or what do you need to change because you know you lost. He goes, I don't need to change anything. He I'm the champion. He needs to come to me, and that's what you need. Why does he have to chase him? The other time we were chasing him because okay, he was in he was in England, this that the other. Okay, he's in Ireland. Fine. But he's the champion, and you've got champions and judges on, on, on the panel over there. They will see what's going on. Why does he have to chase him down? Frampton needs to come to him. Frampton wants his belt. So that's how, he, if he plays that mindset, Frampton's in trouble because now Frampton has to come to him. When Frampton comes to him, now he's got bombs waiting to lay him down you. And I don't think Frampton can take his bombs because when Frampton got hit in the first fight, that's why he was moving around the room. So I'm going with uh, Kiko Martinez, yeah, by either points or stoppages. Roll with him all day. I just think Frampton right now hasn't done anything of, of late, and I'm going with Kiko Martinez, even though he's the older dude. But he's only tw he's older, but he's only 28. He's not even that old. So I'm going with him. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm rolling with. Um, the more the more I hear discussion uh, of this fight, um, the more folks want uh, are leaning towards Kiko Martinez, at least from the full side, uh, uh, go back and forth with, and it, it's making me really think about leaning towards Martinez. I don't know. I think the fight is that close. I'll go to you on this with Ken. Quickly, your assessment of the fight, and what's your prediction? I've been going back and forth on this fight for about a month, <laughs> just thinking about it, going back and forth, back and forth, and I'm going to go with the rising tide of Kiko Martinez. That man is, 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 is on the rise, and he's dangerous, and he can punch, and he's, and he's, and he ha and he's hungry. And yes. in, that, in, that, in, in that first fight, he got knocked out. But then he came back and he won a world championship. And, and for some reason, he looks different now. He's got like a killer instinct that I've never seen from him. He's, he just seems so much different now. I don't know if it's the fact he's got the belt. I don't know if it's the fact that Sergio Martinez is now backing him along with, you know, the other people that are around him, but he just seems so much different now. And I'm going to go with Kiko by uh, late round, late in round stoppage. Interesting, interesting. Um, do you think the fact that, what do you think is the big motivating, the bigger motivating factor here? Uh, uh, the wave of Mars, well, let me, let me take that back. You both said the, um, you both riding the wave of, of Kiko Martinez here. Um, with that being said, do you think that uh, Frampton um, going through such a tough fight the first time out and surviving, and not only surviving, ended up stopping his man, um, 
do you think that may um, play well for him in this rematch? As if look at him, uh, Frampton looking himself in the mirror and saying, "I went through it the first time. I survived what he went through, and yes, he might have gotten better, but I know I can deal it. Deal with it, and may bolster him, give him, give Frampton conf confidence heading into this fight." I, I think so. I think so. I, I I do think that, but at the same time, um, what has um, Kiko done lately? And what has Frampton done lately? Mm -hmm. Kiko has beaten three top 20 junior featherweights. All mm -hmm. in a row. Romero. Nathabula, who gave Donaire a tough fight and he just beat him up. And Hasegawa. Hasegawa. Even though Hasegawa has been knocked out before, it's the level of opposition. And he beat him in Japan. Hasn't fought that level. Hasn't fought that level in quite some time. Yeah, Kiko and, and, he beat, and Kiko beat him in Japan. Yes, thrashed him in Japan. Remember that was. I don't think that was a very close fight to be to begin with. I just think he beat him up personally. The scores were a lot closer because it was in Japan. But the point is, I thought Kiko was was was. He was the boss in that fight. He was the boss against Matt Fabula. He was the boss against Romero. And I think he's riding a, a wave right now. And he's confident. I have no doubt that Frampton probably has confidence because he beat him before. But I just think the level of opposition may catch up with him. Um, I'm, before we move on to the last fight and begin to shut down the show, um, Errol, uh, what's the vibe, vibe over there in the UK uh, regarding this rematch? Uh, who are folks leaning towards? Naturally, people, uh, the fight fans are going to go with Frampton. And everyone, majority of Frampton. I was going with Frampton until I looked into the fight. And what gives me the thing, there's a, there's a YouTube channel called Irish NK, right? And like again with with, with Broner like on fight, I, I went into the channel. And when I seen the channel, now Barry Hearn has uh, Kiko Martinez as a champion is there. And he's in a sports center, or what you call a uh, mall, whatever you call it over in the States. And he's in the ring and he's, he's he hitting pad work. And you've got Frampton outside watching him and Barry's talking to him. I'm like, why do you need to keep pet talking this dude, man? You're a world-class fighter, but yet you have him watching Kiko, the champion, in the ring. And I, I just feel like, and a lot of time Barry's looking at him all the time, trying to say, well, you know, this is it. Putting a lot of pressure on the kid. I think there's so much pressure on him. I think he, I think, I think, I think he's, even though he knows he's won, it's that he knows he hasn't been fighting up to par and the best thing, and Barry has a lot on the line because Barry has invested a lot of money in in, uh, in Frampton. He left Eddie Hearn, remember? He, he told Frampton to leave Eddie Hearn and think, I'll be better for you, right? So this is everything. This is all and everything for Frampton. If he was to lose this fight, the whole Irish thing, the whole money thing for Barry is gone. You understand? It's gone. You Now you give up your rights. Now you have to be begging for fights. So this is massive for him. For Kiko, man, Kiko's good. You know, he's got his confidence back. He's been fighting the best guys in the world. He's great, man. And, and, and if I look into that, that whole thing, the odds will tell you that Frampton's going to win because of what happened in the first fight. But this is like Tony Zell and Rocky Greziano. Don't think the second fight is going to be the same as the third fight. You're having a laugh. These are top, both top guys. But your mindset of what you're coming into, I won't be surprised if Kiko knocks him out. But you ain't going to get a rematch like Greziano. You ain't going to get a rematch. <laughs> You might do, but I doubt it. So the island, the dude over here in the UK is Frampton all day. Anyone, no one will tell you anything. They got Frampton winning the fight. Well, I know some some Brits on um, a, a page that I'm I'm on that they're, they're they're leaning towards Kiko. They just they see the same things we're saying. But we're talking Irish. Are we talking about fight fighting guys? Are you talking about thing? They 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 Irish got law Irish. They're going with Frampton. They go. Most people. Okay. We don't. You, you're talking about boxing dudes like ourselves. We're nerds, yeah. We we understand. We know. We don't want to make a fool of ourselves. We have to look at every little thing and create it, critique it. The guys who just not swing or just just casual. And there's a lot of casual guys who know Frampton. They go Frampton. Uh, the, the the mood over there in Ireland is massive. When the fight was announced, everyone in the UK Frampton, Frampton, Frampton. On I for London and all the major things, they're going for Frampton. You'll get occasionally, yeah, some British guys who, who are not caught up in the thing, and that's the ones you probably talk to. 
But the ones I normally they are saying Frampton for real. And the mood over here is we expecting Frampton to to take Keith. When it was first announced, he was like, Frampton's gonna win the belt. He's already a champion already in effect because he knocked them out already. That's what everyone's thinking, but this is gonna be different. And it does why the, the the strength of competition that Kiko was fought against, in my opinion. Uh, let's talk yeah, about and listen, and I'm going to say this right now. Go ahead. Kiko, yeah. in his last four fights, he's only fought once in his home. All the other fights were 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 outside of Spain, Argentina. Um, you know, what was it? Argentina, the U.S. Argentina, Japan. U.S. Uh, Japan in in Japan in his last fight. Yeah. It says, if that says everything good, that says everything you need to need, that's like a fighting champion. Man's willing to come at his home and just take on all comers, isn't it? See? He didn't just sit down and say, I'm going to say in Spain or wherever. He's coming out. They're very confident. But you know, Frampton could beat him because he beat him already. But it's, things have changed, you know? Things have changed. His timing, boxing's all about timing and everything, you know? And maybe it's, it's, it's Kiko's time. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Kiko Martinez didn't deserve a title shot, but but he but he did what he had to do to, to get that. You know why he got the title shot? Because they thought he was done. He was just a notable name. They thought it was he framed and knocked him out. This is how it is. They framed and knocked him out. They thought he was done. They didn't think he was going to come in and do that. Only Kiko knew he wasn't done because if you look at the fight, he he, he was winning the fight. It's just that he made the mistake of coming in. But he, if he makes a mistake like Donny. And Victor, Victor Chinian, <laughs> he might just do. He Frampton might be losing the fight, and and, and Frampton and Fra um, Frampton could be losing the fight to Kiko, and then that thing could happen again. You know what I'm saying? That that same thing could just play out again. I thought, I thought Kiko was winning the, the the first fight pretty. Not, not well. It was clear cards. he was winning. It was not the scorecards. Not the scorecards. He was winning. Frampton was winning the scorecards. Yeah, but but an unbiased scorecard. I said he was winning. I thought Martinez was winning. Yeah, I, that's why I thought as well because he was he was bringing the thing and I was saying he was gonna knock him out and then when he got knocked out, like it, it was he was trying to knock Frampton out and Frampton caught him. Shows, but what it shows Frampton has the power to knock him out. You see, that's what Frampton, that's what it shows though. That's your yeah. Let's move on to this last fight because this show was really really long. Uh, fight not happening this weekend but happening early next week. As um, again we're getting into some boxing nerdum here because we've been on that for a while. Moving back down to the flyways as. Uh, um, I'm not uh, Rung Roy from Thailand. He's going to be defending his IBF uh, flyweight belt against uh, mandatory challenger Magu Williams Arroyo uh, next week on uh, Tuesday um, in Thailand. In Thailand, um, and looking at this fight on national television, right? And Rung Roy coming off of his win, uh, ups, minor upset win against uh, Kazuta Aoka in Japan. Coming back against a, a mandatory defense against Arroyo, and I'll go to you too you on this one, Ken. Um, the thing about Arroyo, um, the thing that he has is power. Um, I watched his last couple of fights um, against uh, Tamayo um, in Puerto Rico and Bayamon, scored him, um, knocked him down uh, three times in winning a fourth round KO in his last fight uh, this past June, a couple of months ago, three months ago, I should say, against Salodar. Filipino fighter. He starts them out in round two, uh, courtesy of a left hook. Um, so he has power. He's a solid fundamental fighter. Um, but in, in assessing this fight, looking at the style of Rung Roy, uh, Rung Roy is going to be in dangerous because of the power. But I wonder, does Arroyo have what it takes to get to um, Rung Roy, who has a terrific jab, uh, terrific skill, and he can really he can move really well on his feet. Um, pretty intriguing matchup here, Ken. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm going to lead towards um, I'm not by decision. Um, I think it'll be a competitive fight. I just think um, Rung Roy will do more boxing. Um, I, I, do, I don't know what Arroyo, McWilliams Arroyo has outside of the power. Can he go and box and, and win a decision in Thailand? It's going to be very difficult. Yes. Um, He's going to have to go for the knockout because I already know if that goes to the car, it's going to I'm not. It, there's no, it, it's very hard to win a title fight against a Thai fighter in Thailand. Very difficult. You have to knock him out. Um, that's, that's what Celestino Caballero did when he went to Thailand. He had to knock him out to win the belt. He did. 
Um, but yeah, you, you, I think I think Omni is going to outbox him. I, I don't think there'll be any controversy. They may they may be, but I don't think so. I think I think this guy outboxes him and wins a, a clear decision. Yeah, uh, I think he's going to win by um, Robo is going to win by decision as well. And I'll go see you on this one, Arrow. Uh, your assessment of the fight and thoughts about uh, Rumble because uh, rumors early on. Uh, that should Rung Roy win, he could possibly face uh, Zhu Shiming, uh, if not later on this year, then early next year. Uh, your thoughts on this fight uh, with uh, Rung Roy and uh, Arroyo? Yeah, the, f the fight's on Wednesday over here. Um, it's going to be a Wednesday, but um, I've just, you know, while you were talking about it, I didn't even know his fight was coming up and it was on a Wednesday. Yeah, I said Tuesday, but it's actually Wednesday. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. No, that's all right. Because um, you know, when you were talking, I was trying to think. But you know what? This this fight looks very competitive, man. I see the records and stuff like that, man. They both got winning records, and uh, it, it, for me to look at it, like I know uh, Rumbleway's knockout percentage is is, is is not the highest. You know, out of 13 fights, he's only knocked out five people, right? But the, the opponent, man, uh, what's it? Matt Williams, uh, or whatever his name is. Like he's listen, bro. Like he's got a winning record as well. Like and he's he's knockouts. His knockout percentage is high, man. It's much higher. So you know, um, a royal. I think a royal probably win this fight, man. But I, I but I haven't to be honest with you. I haven't seen them fight. But what I'm seeing is you, the winner at this fight. If they're gonna fight Yuzhou Min, that's the massive payday for any of them two. But he, you're right. If he go win the fight, he will knock this dude out, bro. He has to knock the guy. The guys from Puerto Rico we're talking about, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, he, yeah, 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 he's a big puncher, man. He's gonna look. He's expecting. He ain't looking to go the distance. And I think he got. If he got the right mentality, from what I'm seeing, he he be knocking everyone out. So <laughs> actually, he's lost. Actually, he lost on decision. He actually lost one point by um, one fight by this um, decision. But I think that's the right way to buy it. And I'm gonna be focusing to watch that fight. But from what I'm going by, this, the, the the box rec and the stats, I don't really know. I haven't seen these two guys. What I'm seeing, it should be a cracking fight, but. I'm expecting someone to, hey, one guy's going to knock out or one guy's going to go the distance. And the winner fight, usually, uh, that should be great, man. That should be good. So I'm looking forward to that fight come Wednesday. And I think on that show, on that note, I should say we're going to um, shut the show down uh, for the evening. Uh, before we shut the show down, however, I'll go to you on this one, EJ. Uh, give you all, let you give, you give you an opportunity to give you information now. Uh, for those who want to uh, talk boxing with you and whatnot, uh, let the folks know where they can find you. Oh yeah, EJ Boxing Live on YouTube, man. That's that's where I'm at, man. I mean, you can like I've got a lot of videos about like mostly all weight division stuff like that, debate boxing, your boxing beats and rhymes, have hangouts and stuff like that. I mean, if you want to catch me there, um, I have a Twitter, but to be honest with you, I just really post stuff up and I don't really use it and that. So <laughs> EJ Boxing Live um, over there, and um, yeah, man. Um, Welcome, you guys are welcome, man. Yeah, and I think Kent uh, stepped out for us on a uh, stepped away for, uh, and I'll give you the information if you want to talk with Kent, uh, chat about boxing, or not. You can go to facebookcom forward slash Kent dot airs dot one. You repeat that facebookcom for facebookcom forward slash Kent dot airs dot one. I reach out to him. Just let you, uh, you know, respond to everybody. The only response is a select few. Uh, just let them know that you're a follower. Uh, a watcher of the Pound for Pound Box Report, you listen to a YouTube show, a listener of the podcast, or uh, uh, you watch, you uh, read the blog, and then, and probably only then, is when he'll talk with you because um, he's not here for trolls. I'm just gonna let you know right now, if you're a troll, uh, forget about it. He will, he will use the block button as your friend quickly. Um, and for me, if you want to find out about me, uh, like I said in the beginning of the show, two places you can go. You can go to the blog page. Uh, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. You can go to the podcast page, p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. Um, you can also check me out on uh, Brother JR on Twitter. You can check out the Pound for Pound Box Report on Twitter, um, at p4pboxingreport on the blog page and on the podcast page. Uh, you can find links to find any, any uh, Pound for Pound Box Report all over social media on Podomatic, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Tumblr, Twitter, Pinterest board. We got a Pinterest board. Um, the RSS feed, which you can subscribe to. We're also the Pound for Pound Box Report podcast is now on Stitcher Radio. Just go on Stitcher Radio, just type in Pound for Pound Box Report. Be a friend, leave a review, give us your thoughts on the Pound for Pound Box Report, on ways we can improve the show and whatnot. Um, and also, you can link to where you can donate your account, donateyouraccount.com forward slash p 
P4P Box Report. Donate, remember, repeat that, donateyouraccount.com slash P4P Box Report. Um, on the next episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, um, we will do a recap of all the boxing that went down uh, the Yagashi Roman Gonzalez fight, the Anui fight, um, Adrian Broner, his fight with Emmanuel Taylor, Lucas Matisse, his fight with Ortiz. Uh, Andre Berto and his fight with Steve Chambers, uh, Francisco Estrada, Juan Francisco Estrada, his title defense against Giovanni Segura, the Kiki Martinez, Carl Frampton rematch, as well as the Ahmad Rung Roy, um, Harry Arroyo fight. We will do recaps of that, and we will get into full analysis of uh, Floyd Mayweather and his rematch with Marcos and Maidana. We will talk about that in depth, and I'm not promising anything, but maybe, maybe we may do a live post-fight show uh, on YouTube Breaking down uh, the Mayweather, my down and two. Um, also on that card, Leo Santa Cruz. Uh, he's going to be defending his junior featherweight belt against um, Manuel Roman. Miguel Vasquez is going to be defending his lightweight belt against Mickey Bay. We will talk about those fights as well. Um, so that's it. I want to thank um, my co host Ken for joining us. I want to thank you, EJ Arrow from EJ Boxing Life, for joining us. Thanks for joining us again. Join me again, man. All right, peace. No problem. And for the next. This has been another episode of the Pound for Pound Fox Report. We will see you next time. Good night.